Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me. Let me tell you something. When it comes to diagnosing people, the internet is stupid. The internet is just plain stupid when it comes to diagnosing people. And let me explain. Someone from a magazine asked me to provide some opinion because they are writing a piece on diagnosing characters from Game of Thrones. And I gave them a few of my opinions, a few quotes. But then I went online to see what others were saying, and I was astonished at all the bad information out there. To some of you, you might wonder, you might be astonished at my astonishment, but I, I, I thought I would find at least, I don't know, a few articles with accurate information written by clinicians. But the first page of Google searches brought up a bunch of bad articles written by people who clearly have no idea what they're doing, even clinicians, by the way. So I tried the second page of Google Hits, and the same thing. A bunch of bad articles written by people who clearly have no idea what they're doing. So I tried the third page, and same thing. So in this episode, I'm going to provide a critique of these popular websites and what they're saying, and I'm also going to provide a diagnosis for several Game of Thrones characters from my opinion. This episode is going to take a while. I'm guessing at least a couple hours. So get ready for a lot of Game of Thrones talk. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am a professor and a therapist. Just so you know, before we get going, I'm going to spoil everything up until early 2017. So I'm going to spoil everything in up and you know up through season six of the TV show, and up through book five in the Song of Ice and Fire. So just know everything's going to be spoiled. So go out and watch the show, read the books if you don't want things to be spoiled. Okay, so let's get into it. I'm going to do it by alphabetical order from first name, and we have Ares, the Mad King Targaryen. He is not in the TV show very much. He's a he's a historical figure. Uh, he happens before the first book happens. Uh, he's the Mad King that Robert and Eddard and the Lannisters overthrew and put Robert Baratheon on the Iron Throne. So um, what does... So I'm going to... With each of these characters from Game of Thrones, I'm going to uh, give some quotes from different websites and then I'll provide my opinion. So with Ares, the Mad King Targaryen, uh, the, the popular website that I found was a blog of thrones.com, a blog of thrones. And they identified Ares, the Mad King Targaryen, you know, the one who wanted to set King's Landing on fire. He identified the Mad King as suffering from pyromania. And in this instance, they're at, he's actually, whoever was writing this article was actually correct. It's one of the, I know I was going to talk about, I knew I was going to talk a lot of crap about a lot of websites, but, but in this instance, the blog of thrones.com actually, they were correct. Uh, so, but let me go into Ares Targaryen a little further beyond pyromania. So yeah, yeah, he suffered from pyromania. Let's go through the DSM five criteria for that. A repeated deliberate fire setting. Yes, he had repeated deliberate fire setting. For instance, he burned Rickard Stark alive. This was Eddard's father. Uh, tension or affective arousal before the act. Yes, uh, according to the books, it made him horny to think about starting things on fire. <laughs> Fascination with fire. Yes. Did he derive pleasure from fire? Yes. Was the fire not for any particular gain, you know, like arson that for insurance purposes or something? Yes, he, he often shot himself in the foot to see things burn. He just, he loved to burn things so much that it actually got him killed in the end in some ways. I mean, in, in, in a, you know, in addition to a bunch of other bad leadership skills that he presented. <laughs> also, is it not attributable to some other disorder? And I would say, yeah, it's not attributable. So he really fits the full criteria, although he's not a classic case because if you actually read case studies with classic cases of, of pyromaniacs, as we might call them, uh, he's not, he's not, uh, I wouldn't say pyromania was his, was his primary dis 
disorder. His primary disorder is schizophrenia and uh, or some other psychotic disorder. It could have been uh, bipolar with psychosis or something. It's hard to tell uh, because it's not like the books give us a full you know, course of his mental illness. But I, I would say the, the, the most likely diagnosis that we would land upon is schizophrenia. Oh, by the way, before going forward, I just want to say something up front. And people who've listened to this podcast know th- this. The issue of, or the, the practice of diagnosing mental illness f- uh, from the DSM-5 is a complicated one in that, If you have a medical condition, like a broken bone, you fall off a ladder, you break a bone in your arm, you go to the the emergency room, they take an x-ray, they see a broken uh, bone, you know, they they actually see the bone is broken, they uh, send it to a radiologist, the radiologist looks at it and says, yep, broken bone, they send you to a bone person or someone else and and they diagnose whatever their diagnosis is, broken bone of the, of the blah, blah, blah bone. Treatment, plan, uh, you know, set the bone, and, you know, put a cast on, physical therapy, that kind of stuff. So that's in the medical profession. In the psychological professions, mental health professions, it is not like that. Uh, not usually anyway. Someone comes into my office And I can't scan them with an x-ray. I can't take their blood and look for biomarkers that suggest a particular syndrome or condition or disorder. I have to usually just ask the client to tell me what their experience is or what they, what they feel or what they typically do on a typical day. And then I use the DSM five to guide me toward a likely construct is what we call them. We don't call them things. We don't, because a broken bone is a thing. When you have a broken bone, there's no, there's no subjective reality to that. You have a broken bone, but when you have depression or anxiety or PTSD or schizophrenia, these are things that as a profession in mental health, we, co- we construct. For instance, we have different types of schizophrenia, for instance. Well, we could, if we wanted to, if we just got together and decided to, we could say that all those different types of schizophrenia are actually different disorders. We could you know, have four different disorders that uh, under, uh, and, and, you know, we could split them all up and, and we do this actually in our field, the DSM will take disorders and split them up and combine them and move them around and change them over the years. And so, whereas broken bone, it, you know, it's been, that's been the broken bones since the beginning of time. I'm guessing the ancient Greeks and the ancient Chinese cultures and the ancient, uh, American cultures, they all knew what a broken bone was. <laughs> and so uh, I'm just guessing but the idea of mental illness has changed as culture has changed. And in a hundred years, I guarantee you our construct of mental illness will change along with it. Now, some things will probably remain stable, schizophrenia probably being one of them, but it's hard to tell because they have changed over time. So as I provide my opinion on applying labels and constructs to these fictional characters in these books, keep all that in mind that this is not a hard science. This is not something that I can, even if I had a real human being that I was assessing, I couldn't take a reading and mark a number into a, uh, you know, my, the file, the client file and, and determine whether or not it means this or that in reality. It's just things that we, we construct as a guide for treatment. You know, when, when someone seems to fit these criteria, we apply this label of schizophrenia because that helps us to treat them and to understand what will likely be the course of their, their issue as they present. Someone comes in with schizophrenia, well, in all likelihood, in five years, they're probably still going to be suffering from that. And these are the medications that are going to work. And these are the psychotherapies that might soothe the client. These are the, the family systems issues that might help. These are 
the other things, you know, there's, there's all these uh, just guidelines, really. And they're very squishy. For some people, it'll work. And for some people, it won't work. So it's, um, it's an imprecise science. And so as I provide my opinion, although I'll probably sound a little pompous because when I read these other websites and what they're saying, it's laughable. And to any clinician, honestly, it would be laughable. Or any clinician that knows what we're talking about. Because some of these are actually clinicians that are writing. But understand that you could argue with me. Anyone could argue with me, and and that would be legitimate. You know, every there there are th- particularly when we get into personality disorders. My God, the pe- people argue about those kinds of things all the time, mostly because we don't really know what it is, and and everyone is sort of describing a different thing. That <laughs> while I'm on this jag, I just kind of want to do this. One of the things that I will lecture about to my students is the definition of rap okay you know everyone understands what rap is right well when i was growing up in the 80s beastie boys were a rap band or a rap group or rap outfit or rap whatever hip-hop the the term hip-hop didn't really emerge as a popular term until the early 90s but in the 80s you know you had beastie boys and you had run dmc and vanilla ice and and mc hammer uh or wait, MC Hammer, um, <laughs> Ice Cube, Ice T, these MWA, these people, Public Enemy. This was this was referred to me as as rap music. Well, I don't know. I'm dating myself, but probably like ten years ago or something. I was talking with some clients who were teenagers, and one of them said, uh, "I said, oh yeah, rap. You know, like Beastie Boys or something." And then they're like, "Oh, Beastie Boys. That that's not rap. That's rock." So they, they said that Beastie Boys were rock. Okay. So at the time I thought, well, that's ridiculous. Of course, Beastie Boys are rap. But really, it's all a matter of classification. What do you define as rap? Do you define rap as being, you know, as having these criteria or a different set of criteria? According to my criteria that I absorbed or, you know, sort of solidified in the, in the mid 80s during, mainly during the Run DMC popularity times uh whatever criteria i have for rap the beast particularly the early early beastie boys they qualified they qualify as rap to me then and they still do to someone else they have a different set of criteria for what rap is so but neither one is right you understand like no one can say what rap is it all just depends on how you define it well mental disorders are exactly the same way all the disorders, all, you know, a group of people get together and decide this is how we're, this is the label and this is what, how we're going to define it. And it, and, and the criteria are also in the eye of the beholder, right? So let's say, you know, with rap, we say, well, you have to talk instead of sing, you know, you, you're not singing like law and how do you define singing? You know, extended vowels with a tonality to, it, you know, like la, 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 that's singing. Whereas rap is, you know, hello, I, my name is Kirk and I'm here to say I like to work and I like to play. <laughs> oh my God. Um, so that's one criteria. Well, what about certain kinds of hip hop where, it's sort of like singing, but it's also kind of rhythmically talking. I mean, in some ways you could say Bob Dylan in a lot of his songs wasn't singing. He was just talking, you know, but it's not really tonality. It's just, so was, was he rapping? So the criteria are in the eye of the beholder. And again, it's just, it's just different individuals making different decisions about different criteria that are for different labels that we call diagnoses. And the term diagnosis is confusing because, again, in the medical field, when you have a broken bone, the diagnosis is is pretty is you know is you probably universally accepted among physicians. You know, everyone looks at oh, broken bone disorder of the blah blah blah, blah bone. I'm guessing, or at least I'd hope that if you know everyone looked at an X-ray, they'd all say, "Yep, that's the diagnosis." Well, in my field. You present someone with what some people consider narcissistic personality disorder to a hundred different mental health clinicians and even ones that know what they're talking about, I guarantee you're going to get a lot of different opinions. Well, that's, that's why it's a construct and it's cultural and it's in the eye of the beholder. So 
take everything that I'm about to say with that in mind. Having said that, there are certain conventions that I know are, are, you know, established in my field that a lot of these websites that I'm going to critique are, are going against. They're not, they're not following (laughs) the normal convention and they're not using the normal criteria and they're not, they're the, the eye of their beholder is not uh, anything close to what the, the, the typical bell curve of clinicians would, would exhibit. So anyway, all right. So Aries, the mad King Targaryen, a blog of Thrones says pyromania. And I agree. Uh, and the second diagnosis for Aries Targaryen is schizophrenia. And let's go through the criteria here. All right, so you need two or more of the following to qualify for schizophrenia. First, you need delusions. That's, you know, one out of the five things that you need. Uh, So you need two or more. Uh, Delusions, yes. He had several grandiose, paranoid, health-related, persecutory delusions. He thought he was going to be the best king in history when he became king, which is, you could call it a grandiose delusion. He didn't let anyone touch him, which is a delusion of, of that touch equaled harm. He was highly suspicious of everyone, uh, most notably Tywin Lannister and Prince Rhaegar, which is an example of paranoid delusions. Uh, So we got that one. Hallucinations. There's no evidence of hallucinations that I can remember from the books. Disorganized speech. Again, no evidence that I remember. Disorganized behavior. Yes, he had mood swings. He had strange behavior that was seemingly unrelated to the situations, bouts of crying, bouts of, you know, getting super angry and explosive outbursts and severe joy without any reason. So that's what we might call disorganized behavior. Any negative symptoms? No, no no evidence of that. Uh, So he meets two of he, he got two of those. He got, so he just met the threshold of schizophrenia there. Uh, level of functioning has suffered. Yes, he's not a good king at all. <laughs> so, and did it persist for six months? Uh, it's, I don't remember that specific in the books, but I'm pretty sure it did. So really when it comes to schizophrenia, uh, Aries Targaryen is actually a mild case he does meet criteria in my opinion and uh but it's it's a it's a mild case because he he only uh meets the criteria somewhat the problem is that he was king and could do a lot of damage with his problems right so um so there's that um the other diagnosis is psychopathy or antisocial personality disorder in this talk that is already super long and I'm only one character into this. Oh my God, how long is this going to take? Um, I'm going to use psychopathy and any social personality disorder for the most part interchangeably, although they are slightly different. Some people consider them to be the same thing in, in my world. And some people in my world consider them to be slightly different, but I'm just going to use them interchangeably because that's my preference. <laughs> Cause basically the core of psychopathy or psychopathic personality disorder and the core of, of, um, any social personality disorder, are basically the same. Uh, you could argue with me if you want, and that's fine. But Aries Targaryen show definite signs of psychopathy and any social personality disorder because just because you have paranoid delusions doesn't mean that you kill a bunch of people without any remorse and without any thought or any empathy. People with schizophrenia, with paranoid delusions, they have empathy. You know, there's, there's nothing barring someone with schizophrenia from having empathy or remorse. So we have to, add, because Aries was just so sadistic and terrible, we have to probably acknowledge uh, some level of psychopathy in any social personality disorder. The other possibility here is paranoid personality disorder, which is, uh, you know, I've, I've talked in other episodes about par- about personality disorders. And I just have to say a, another caveat from the start is if you're not a clinician who, who has expertise in, in personality disorders, I can almost guarantee you, you do not know what a personality disorder is. Personality disorders are so confusing. Uh, It took me years to understand how, how, what, what the authors and what all the researchers were talking about when they were talking about 
the different personality disorders. I remember taking, you know, a, a couple years of school in my master's studying different personality disorders and just really like going, huh? And really it wasn't until I encountered people with particular personality disorders. It wasn't until then that I really was like, oh, I get it. And there, there's no YouTube video that's going to help you. And there's no, definitely no text that's going to help you. You have to experience these human beings in all of their full, the full breadth of their personality, not only the full breadth of their personality, but the way it feels to you when you interact with them, which is actually a pretty good, a pretty good um, uh, set of data. I always use the way someone makes me feel as a guide regarding personality disorders. So I'm going to say that as a caveat as we move forward to that, because we're going to, because a lot of people talk about personality disorders on the internet about Game of Thrones characters, and I'm going to as well. But just know that in this talk, I'm not going to be able to convey to you what that means, what personality disorders exactly mean. I can convey to you what schizophrenia is for the most part. I can convey to you what PTSD is. I can convey to you what pyromania is. I can convey to you what depression is. But I, but personality disorders, just, just, just people out there, please, for the love of God, just understand that unless you are an expert in that area, you, you don't know what it is. And there's no way you're going to be able to find out. And there's no YouTube video and there's no article. Uh, there's nothing other than experiencing people in a clinical setting with clinical guidance about what you're looking at. You are just never going to know what that is. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I see a lot of people throwing around personality disorder labels. You know, Trump has narcissistic personality disorder was a big one that has been happening a lot lately. In the past, it was Obama that had narcissistic personality disorder. And I just, I, you know, people just need to stop. They just need to stop that. It, it, there are things in the medical field, like, like again, getting back to the medical field. When, when I have a broken bone and my bone is sticking out through my <laughs> skin, I don't need to be a genius or a, I, don't have to, I, need to, I don't need to go through a bunch of medical uh, education to understand that my, bo my bone has broken in my arm. So there are some medical conditions that are, you know, easier to diagnose than others. Whereas other kinds of things like, I don't know, an autoimmune disorder of the, you know, that affects the lining of your intestines or something. My guess is, is that it's, it's harder to, you know, understand what that is or, MS or something. I don't know. There's probably certain medical disorders that uh, uh, medical professionals pull their hair out when they look on the internet and see everyone diagnosing people with it when medical professionals fully know that that's a very complicated disorder that requires a, a, an expert to really understand and, and to really look at an individual in their entirety to even begin to guess that they might have that medical condition. Well, personality disorders are the same way. Anyway, so <laughs> Ares, the mad King Targaryen, uh, you know, you could have, one could argue he suffered from paranoid personality disorder since he didn't exhibit hallucinations or disorganized speech, speech or the negative symptoms that are associated with schizophrenia. It's possible that he had paranoid personality disorder instead of schizophrenia. He was highly paranoid. It seemed to be a persistent personality trait in him. He was obsessed with who was loyal and who was not. And his mood swings could have been a result of him feeling as though everyone was out to get him. So we could be seeing a paranoid personality and we're mistaking it for schizophrenia because it just happens to kind of look like that. Now, again, in my caveat, I said that there's no biomarker between schizophrenia and, pers and paranoid personality disorder. It's, it's in the eye of the beholder uh, to some extent. And so... Um, so just know that. All right. So that's, that's, so in conclusion for Aries, the mad King, I would say either schizophrenia or some other psychotic disorder, some other disorder that involves psychosis or paranoid personality disorder. I kind of like paranoid personality disorder to some extent. Um, pyromania, uh, definitely, but it's, but it's a, a kind of a, a, a typical case to some extent and a dash of antisocial personality and psychopathy, May, maybe traits of, of it, uh, if not, if, the, if not the full-blown disorder. All right, let's go on to Alistair Thorne. You remember Alistair Thorne, good old Alistair? He's the guy who always hated Jon Snow at the wall. 
All right. A blog of thorn, a blog of thrones.com says narcissism and quote, when a person has an inflated sense of their own importance and complete disregard towards others, often seeing them as inferior to them, his speech to the night's watch when announcing the death of Jon Snow confirms it as he centers most of it around himself, unquote. Uh, yeah, well, me, what I would say is narcissism is not a diagnosis. So without a standard definition, anyone can call anyone a narcissist. So, uh, I, I don't know exactly what to say to a blog of Thrones in that way. Cause narcissism is the, the, the art, these articles were all saying these are mental illnesses. And, uh, so just even the terminology they use just indicates it's like, you don't even know the terms. <laughs> um, but anyway, so narcissism is not a diagnosis. What I would say is Alistair Thorne, there's no evidence of mental illness. I, I read other articles from clinicians even that were saying that he had narcissistic personality disorder. I mean, you know, you, again, with, with different eyes of beholders, you could absolutely, whenever I say that eyes of beholder, I think of, um, cause I'm a D and D player, the beholder thing. <laughs> but anyway, um, Alistair Thorne, in my opinion, has no, there's no evidence presented in the books that he has any mental illness at all. He's just massively insecure, in my opinion. He is frequently trying to humiliate and put down Jon Snow, which we see, but that's just a classic uh, sign of, in, of massive insecurity. I'm guessing his father humiliated him a lot, or he, he was bullied a lot as a kid because he's, he's, he bullies Jon Snow all the time. It's just a defensive projection. He's projecting his internal sense of his own incompetence and his own weakness onto Jon Snow and then attacking Jon. This is what we call making the internal conflict external. It's a, it's a, it's a defense mechanism that, that people do all the time. But that's not a mental illness. It's just a common defense mechanism that everyone uses. So in conclusion, Alisha Thorne, no evidence of mental illness. And I wouldn't say narcissistic personality disorder. For whatever reason on the internet, everyone loves to apply narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, it's, it's a very trendy thing. Uh, and I think part of the reason is because everyone, it, I, maybe particularly Americans, I don't know. Everyone hates someone who brags, you know, everyone, everyone hates someone who tries to get power and, and every, and everyone hates Alistair Thorne. I don't know. A, I mean, it's funny. I get, a, I've done a lot of episodes on Game of Thrones for this podcast. And if you want to search for it, I'm, I'm putting them all, all the Game of Thrones episodes on psychology in Seattle. Dot com. So if you go to psychologyinseattle.com, there's a button under episodes, I believe, that says like Game of Thrones episodes. And so they're all going to be there because if you just search for them on YouTube, it might be kind of hard to find them or on your phone. But the point I'm making here is that uh, when it comes to like evil characters like Ramsey Bolton, Ramsey Snow, People will email me and say like, oh, Ram, I love Ramsey. He's like sexy. And I, he's my favorite character. Well, no one ever says that about Alistair Thorne. <laughs> Everyone hates that guy. And so when you hate someone, you you just don't, you just want to apply a, a mental disorder to them, right? You just have this kind of like, well, clearly there's something wrong with that guy. And there's also this massive misconception that if someone is being a dick or if someone is presenting bad behavior, then they have to have some mental illness that, that, uh, causes that bad behavior. You know, someone goes on a killing spree for instance, and, and kills a bunch of people. Well, it's, it's a, it's hard for non clinicians. It's hard for the public to accept that that person might not have suffered from any mental illness. Some people will say, well, the fact that they did that it, it means they have to have suffered from a mental illness. Well, I'm here to tell you, no. People make all sorts of weird decisions all the time. And I'm not saying going on a killing spree is good. <laughs> I'm not, I'm saying, you know, it, in, the ter in terms of, of morality and evil and social good, this is an extremely terrible, terrible act done by a, a human being. 
Is there something different about them? Is there a psychological reason for why they did what they did? Yeah, probably. But do they suffer from a mental illness as designated by the various mental illnesses in the, in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual 5th edition? No, this is, it's, it's possible, but it's also possible they don't suffer. In fact, a lot of people who go on these killing sprees have... You know, when people actually look at them, there's no evidence of any disorder at all. And so Alistair Thorne is someone that everyone hates, and he was massively, massively insecure, and he was a total dick to Jon Snow. But honestly, he had his reasons, right? He, he wanted to uphold the rule of law and the rule of tradition, which is to keep the wildlings out of the, the Southlands, right? That, that's their mission. Their mission is to keep the wildlings, and Jon Snow is like, wanting to bring all the wildlings over. And so, you know, there was, Alistair Thorne wasn't alone. He, he had, he had compatriots who hated Jon Snow dead too. So it, it's, um, there's, there's reasons for it and applying a disorder to him, I think is, is short-sighted. Okay. Next character. But before we do that, let's take a break. <laughs> All right, we're back from the break. For those of you who are not a patron, become a patron now by going to patreon.com. That's patreon.com. Become a patron of the podcast and you get access to hundreds of premium episodes, including one episode, one Game of Thrones episode that is only available to patrons in which I <clears throat> in which I analyze Sander Cl- Clegane, the Hound. So uh, go there, do that, become a patron of the podcast, do it now. If you are a patron of the podcast, we love you so much because you are an awesome person and you obviously have great tastes in podcasts. All right, Arya Stark. Let's talk about, so we've talked about Ares the Mad King. We've talked about Alistair Thorne, Arya Stark. We're not even out of the A's and we're already a half an hour into this podcast. My God, this is going to take forever, but it's so fun to talk about, you know? All right. Arya Stark, whatculture.com, whatculture.com. A lot of people had a lot of things to say about Arya Stark. So, and Arya and uh, what culture had a lot of things to say. Whatculture.com, what culture said that Arya Stark suffers from PTSD and the symptoms that they say are regular outbursts of anger, difficulty controlling her aggression and emotions, difficulty falling asleep. She has intrusive thoughts and dreams, and she maintains a hypervigilance to danger. All right. Well, let's look at PTSD. Let's look at the specific criteria for PTSD. All right. First criteria A, criterion A is exposure to a threat. Did she, was she exposed to a threat or to some kind of trauma? Yes, absolutely. She's been exposed to several, several horrible traumas. Okay, B, what is the second criteria? One or more of the following. Uh, does she have intrusive distressing memories? As, you know, some, as, as, as PTSD often does. Does she have an intrusive distressing memories? No, I don't remember any evidence of her having just, you know, essentially like flashbacks, right? Like it, remembering something bad is not a flashback. It has to be intrusive and distressing. Like you're a war veteran from Afghanistan and you're walking down the street and then, and you hear a loud noise and suddenly you're transported back to a moment where you're, friend got killed and there was blood everywhere and and it's like just stuck in your head and you can't get and it's you know it's it's very distressing you have lots of anxiety it do, it feels horrible you know there's no evidence that aria had that experience if if you've saw if you've seen that in the books then let me know but i didn't see all right two nightmares was there any evidence of nightmares i don't remember maybe there, maybe she did have nightmares but i don't remember nightmares dissociation no, I'm not even going to get into explaining dissociation. That, that's kind of like personality disorders. Dissociation is extremely difficult to explain to people. But uh, no, I didn't see any evidence of dissociation. Psychological distress from triggers. No, uh, I didn't see any. Uh, does she have triggers? I, I didn't see any triggers to any kind of trauma, you know. Physiological distress from triggers. No, I don't remember any evidence in the books of physiological distress. Physiological distress is like something triggers, something reminds you of a traumatic event that you've been through and your body completely becomes dysregulated and you can't 
breathe or think or talk or function in those moments. And there's no evidence that she had physiological distress from triggers. Okay. Uh, avoidance of triggers. There's no evidence of that. Uh, two or more of the following. Can't remember the trauma. No evidence of that. Low self-esteem. No evidence of that. In fact, she seems has, she seems to have high self-esteem. Uh, as She's like 10 or 11 years old by the end of the, the, the fifth book. And she's out there killing people and joining the the, you know, <clears throat> the no face people. And, you know, she's, um, f- for someone that's been through so much, I would say she has very high self-esteem. Self-blame, no evidence for that uh, in an excessive manner. Persistent negative emotional state, no evidence of that. Diminished interest in things, no evidence of that. Feeling detached from others, maybe, maybe detachment from others. But she's around people who don't really care about her. I mean, think about the people that she's been around since King's Landing. There's really no one, even at King's Landing, right? I, I guess Eddard would have been the last person that she would have been around who, and uh, that, you know, the the water dancer, or the sword dancer guy, uh, aside, what was his name? Like, Curio or these people were the last people that she ever was with who actually cared about her. You know, the hound was, you know, not super warm, right? And uh, the no face people, they're not, they're not warm at all. So the fact that she's detached from others might just be a product of the fact that she's just never been around someone that she could be close to. So if she were around, say, Jon Snow, maybe she would be really close. And so therefore, she wouldn't meet this criteria. Can't experience positive emotions. Maybe, but she seemingly had fun, uh, you know, with Sandra Clegane. So it's hard to say. So she might have met a couple of those, but again, not in a quintessential PTSD manner. Two or more of the following. Irritable. Eh, not, I mean, she gets angry at times, but I wouldn't say she's like pathologically irritable. Reckless or self-destructive. Kind of, you could kind of make a case for that, but she's on a mission, right? She she wants revenge. She's highly motivated. So I wouldn't call it, I mean, the classic kind of self-destructive and reckless things one does is like in, a, in our modern society is driving too fast or drinking and driving or sexual behavior with people that you don't know very well or spending money faster, you know, just things like that. The things that are, Ari is on a mission, and she, uh, everything she's doing is heading in a particular direction, and she is succeeding. So uh, the, uh, she, I wouldn't say that's reckless or self-destructive. Is she hypervigilant? No. Again, with hypervigilant, it's sort of hard to explain what that means. Um, this episode is already long, so I'm not going to explain it. But her, you know, she's vigilant for sure. She's she's vigilant, but it's just not it's not hypervigilant. She's she's vigilant because she is being literally uh, hunted and tried to be killed by people. You know, her vigilance is totally justified. So uh, that's, that's not what we're talking about in the DSM when we're talking about PTSD hypervigilance. Hyper, the hypervigilance we're talking about from in the PTSD DSM diagnosis is something that is not justified usually. Uh, anyway, exaggerated startle response. I don't see any evidence of that. Problems concentrating. Definitely not. Sleep disturbance. Maybe. Maybe a sleep disturbance. But again, we're not talking about a lot of endorsed criteria for PTSD. So in conclusion, she does not suffer from PTSD. If you know what PTSD looks like, you know Aria does not present those symptoms. Now, being affected by trauma, I, this is, there's, there's going to be a lot of soapboxes I'm going to get on right now. Just because you've been traumatized, as Aria has, she's been obviously traumatized. Just because you've been traumatized does not mean you develop PTSD. PTSD is a very specific reaction to trauma. There are many reactions to trauma, most of which are not in the DSM. Uh, let me think if I can come up with a good analogy that involves the bone breaking thing. Uh, okay, so let's say you're on your roof and you fall off your roof. Well, one of the possible results of falling off your roof is breaking the bone in your arm, right? But there's also a lot of other kinds of things that could happen to you uh, that would be in addition to breaking your arm or 
uh, instead of breaking your arm. You could break your leg or you could break your back or you could have a brain hemorrhage or you could uh, sprain something or you could have a contusion or a laceration or <laughs> what other kind of uh, random medical terminology can I make up here? So when someone goes through a trauma, a psychological trauma, PTSD is but one reaction. And there are many reactions to trauma, most of which are not described in the DSM. And that's a problem, in my opinion. I, I think uh, because the DSM is such a widely used uh, uh, instrument for understanding the human nature, which is a travesty, but th because it's used as a way to understand human nature, it 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 should include other kinds of traumatic traumatic reactions because there's so many kinds. Anyway, getting back to what cult so whatculture.com says PTSD, I say no. Whatculture.com also says uh, obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. And to this is one of my very first. So PTSD, when when someone applies that to Aria, I'm just like I can imagine clinicians who don't know what they're doing doing that. In fact, I have supervisees who will diagnose people with PTSD, and then I'm like, okay, so so just tell me which criteria they meet, and they're like, well, you know, they've been traumatized and they're kind of anxious, and I'm like, well, that's that PTSD is a very long disorder has a lot of criteria. It's one of the longest uh, lists of criteria in the DSM. And you can't just say they were traumatized and they're anxious. That's not enough to justify a label of PTSD. You're going to have to go back to the client and assess that person if that's what you want to do. So clinicians will do this, especially novice clinicians. But when it comes to OCD, I feel like most people understand what that is. And in in this, in this article, they're basically saying, well, because she has this obsessive death list that she says every night before she falls asleep, that justifies OCD. And I just have to say, like, that is just the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Well, I've heard a lot of dumb things. It's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Obsessions, let me explain what obsessions are. Obsessions are, rec this is DSM language, recurrent and persistent thoughts, urges, or images that are experienced as intrusive and unwanted and that in most individuals cause the stress and the individual attempts to ignore or suppress those thoughts and urges or images. So again, recurrent and persistent thoughts, thoughts, urges, or images that are experienced as intrusive and unwanted. So as she goes to bed at night, when she is reciting her death list, is that a intrusive thought? No. Is that an intrusive or unwanted urge? No, she wants that urge. It's justified. These people have done horrible things to her and she has reasons to get revenge. In fact, I would say most of us reading the books and watching the TV show are hoping that Arya actually succeeds in doing this sort of thing. So in some ways, it's a justifiable revenge motivation. How is that a how is that related to OCD? <laughs> like if you woke up in the morning and said, Today I'm gonna have a good day, and every day you said that, or every night before you went to bed, you you thanked God for all the good things that are happening in your life. Is that OCD? No. That's just something you do before you go to bed. It's stupid that someone would think that's OCD. It's just dumb. Okay. The next label that whatculture.com says is codependent uh, with the hound. So they think that Arya Stark is codependent with the Hound. Okay, uh, yeah, another stupid thing. Uh, codependent is not a diagnosis. So why are they presenting it as such? I think what if they're trying to use a diagnosis, they would want to use dependent personality disorder. Codependent is a word from Alcoholics Anonymous that usually refers to the spouse of a dependent person, hence the word codependent, as in co-pilot. So... You have an alcohol, you have an alcohol, you have someone who's dependent on alcohol and the spouse is the codependent, like co-pilot. Just because she found a friend, just because Arya Stark found a friend, they have to pathologize that. But we all need people. Imagine that you're 10 years old and everyone is out to kill you. Wouldn't you latch on to someone, anyone who was at least partially on your side, like the hound was? Um... This is just another example of how Westerners pathologize healthy attachment. Arya is reaching out to someone who is 
literally going to save her life and bring her back to her family. And she kind of likes the guy. <laughs> and so how do you call that fucking codependent? So dumb. Uh, okay. Uh, whatculture.com continuing to diagnose Arya Stark dissociative identity disorder, otherwise known as in the past, multiple personality disorder. Uh, quote, let's not even get into dissociative identity disorder thing in her latest story storyline with the faceless men, unquote. Uh, okay. Just more stupidity here. Uh, let's look at the criteria uh, for dissociative identity disorder. Disruption of identity by two or more distinct personality states with discontinuity and sense of self. Does she have that? No. Does she have recurrent gaps of memory? No. Does she have significant distress from these memory gaps or from disruption of identity? No. Uh, dissociative identity similar to personality disorders, similar to just general dissociation, is extremely difficult for me to explain and probably best well actually i do have another podcast episode in which we talk about actually there's two episodes one one in which we talk about dissociative identity disorder in the movie split uh and one in which you talk about dissociative identity disorder in the movie fight club so go out and listen to those if if you want to but dissociative identity disorder is a you know it's a legit thing that happens to people and to call Arya stark as suffering from dissociative identity disorder because she disguises herself as different people is just the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I mean, my God, people. Okay, MTV.com thinks that she has PTSD because she's stuck in survival mode. And and this so the MTV quotes her front. The MTV actually reached out to an actual clinician, I think a mental health counselor and a licensed mental health counselor, and actually like provide. I'm not going to call out these people's names because I don't see the point in that. But MTV quotes just remember actual clinician being stuck ptsd because uh, she's stuck in survival mode she's recited she's reciting that list she's replaying all those traumas that have happened to her her brain isn't being rational it's stuck in an emotional hemisphere it's stuck in an emotional hemisphere what the frick does that mean it's all anger and fear all the time okay so that's what they're saying uh, again, just because someone has been through a trauma and just because they're angry, that doesn't mean they have PTSD. It's just the stupidest thing. I mean, my God, people. Someone's, someone, go, someone, you know, they encounter a trauma and they get angry. That means they have PTSD. That's just so stupid. What, you remember all the criteria that I listed off. And I'll just, again, I'm just going to rattle them off real, really fast. Um, intrusive distressing memories like flashbacks, nightmares, dissociation, psychological distress from triggers, physiological distress from triggers, avoidance of triggers, can't remember the trauma, low self-esteem, self-blame, persistent negative emotional states, uh, diminished interest in things, feeling detached from others, can't experience positive emotions, irritability, reckless, self-destructive, hypervigilance, exaggerated startle response, problems concentrating, sleep disturbances. Now, you don't have to meet all those criteria, but you have to meet a number of them. And she doesn't have any of those things. She's She's been through a trauma and she's angry and therefore she has PTSD. Hey, good boy. Okay. A blog of thrones. What do they say? What? The, okay. Get this. Get this. A blog of thrones. <laughs> a blog of thrones says that Arya Stark has schizophrenia slash multiple personality disorder. In the article, they're, they're saying that schizophrenia and multiple personality disorder are the same thing. <laughs> Uh, quote, Arya Stark's struggle with her own identity versus the one the faceless man want her to take creates this personality conflict within her. Unquote. My God. Uh, dumb, da dumb, dumb, dumb. Idiots. These are completely different disorders. One. Two, we don't use the term multiple personality disorder anymore, but I'll forgive that. It's fine. You can utilize that term. I still use Munchausen by proxy because I like it. It's now called factitious disorder uh, imposed on another. But anyway, uh, so a blog, a blog of Thrones thinks that schizophrenia and multiple personality disorder are the same thing. Uh, they're not, one. And two, she doesn't suffer from either one of those things because they're extremely specific disorders. And I just wonder what this author did. Did they just go on Wikipedia and, and just like glance at the criteria and go like, yeah, it looks about right, you know? Um, you know, it'd be like, be like me as a non-physician, uh, you know, like someone's kind of sick. 
and they they're sniffling. I'm like, I go on the internet and I'm like, yeah, it looks like HIV. You know, this is a per- yeah, you have HIV. <laughs> it's like, oh, uh, okay. So again, what do I say? Aria has. I would say she has nothing. She doesn't suffer from any mental disorder at all. She is actually highly adaptive to her situation. She uh, is actually quite resilient to the traumas that she's been th- that she's been through. She is uh, she's she gets disheartened at times and she gets angry at times, and she is suffering at times. But that's life, you know. That's grief. That's reacting to life. Um, you know, if if someone steps on your toe and you get angry, is that a mental illness that you have? <laughs> no, you're getting angry because someone stepped on your toe. You know, it's it's a it's it's normal life. You don't have to pathologize that. And Arya Stark, in my opinion, does not suffer from schizophrenia. My God, how stupid! She, uh, she doesn't suffer from multiple personality disorder, PTSD, dissociative identity disorder, codependency, which isn't a thing. Uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. My God, no, she doesn't suffer from any of these things. She's she's got a clean bill of mental health. Now, is she a healthy individual? Is she living a healthy life? Uh, that is debatable. Is does she have issues? Clearly, that girl is going to need therapy for a long time after this is all over. But that doesn't mean she has a mental illness. I guess you could make the argument she has an adjustment disorder, maybe. I guess a lot of these people you could, because adjustment disorders kind of have low criteria at times, depending on your point of view, but I'm going to not go down that road. Okay, next character, Bran Stark. Bran, you know, Bran, good old Bran. There goes a loud, very loud motorcycle that annoys me outside my window. Okay, Bran Stark, <clears throat> a blog of thrones.com says, psychoticism, quote, a generic psychiatric term in which a person starts losing contact with reality. Bran is train is Bran is training to have visions through the weirwood trees with the three eyed raven. Unquote. So psychoticism is what a blog of thrones says. Bran Stark is suffering from. Uh, just stupid beyond belief. The term psychoticism has a number of different old definitions and most people don't even use this term anymore. So I, given the track record of blog of Thrones has presented so far, I'm really trying to figure out where they even got that term from. I, uh, I would guess that most clinicians don't even know what psychoticism means or, or have never even heard it before. Uh, one definition of psych psychoticism is psychopathic traits to some degree even small or, you know, like a degree of psych, psych, you know, psycho of psychopathy. And Bran is definitely not psychopathic. He's one of the most empathetic, caring people in Westeros. But what I think a blog of Thrones meant was psychotic. They, they, they confuse psychotic or psychosis with psychoticism. Uh, since they said that he's quote unquote, losing touch with reality, losing contact with reality. Uh, This is uh, additionally stupid. He's actually tapping into his powers, which helps him to see far away and across time. He's not, he's not psychotic. He, he literally has magical powers. So uh, how are, how is he losing touch with reality when he, you know, this is a magical world and they have magical things. Uh, If, if Bran came into a, in, you know, to one, they live on some other planet, literally. So if Bran somehow transported himself to our galaxy and, came to our one of our mental hospitals and reported that he could see through time and you know he could meld with a tree and blah 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 yeah people would think potential psychosis but he he has those powers so he doesn't have that issue so in conclusion brand stark no diagnosis don't be stupid okay brianne of tarth brianne of tarth oh boy let's get into this one a blog of Thrones says masculinity complex slash tomboyism. Masculinity complex slash tomboyism. Uh, quote, or as Sigmund Freud worded it, penis envy. When a girl dresses and behaves like a boy to find significance in her life, unquote. Uh, this, this is, you know, this is stupid too, but it, it, there is actually some merit to what they're saying if they are utilizing 
some definitions of classical Freudian talk. So, but again, there's no DSM diagnosis. I think a blog of thrones, even on their website, they were talking about how this, these were actually medical conditions. They, I don't even think they were referring to them as mental health issues. So there's that. Um, so if we're looking at, if we're, if we're looking at Brianne as, uh, you know, as having a, a mental illness called masculinity complex or tomboyism, then that's completely stupid. But if we're looking at Brianne, Brianne and saying she, she's got issues like, uh, a ma- she has a complex with, with gender. She is a tomboy and she has penis envy. Then, then let's get into that. So First off, penis envy is not dressing up as a boy. That's not what that means. It's way more complicated than that. Uh, I'm not super into the psychosexual stages of classic psychoanalysis, so um, I couldn't even go on for a long time about it if I wanted to. But the 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 bit I do know about it, it's it's not just simply dressing up as a boy. Plus, almost no one uses the construct of penis envy, even psychoanalysts anymore. Um, so, and I'm a psychodynamic person. And so, um, penis envy, it just isn't used anymore, but you know, if you wanted to use that then, and, and you, uh, your, your write up on blog is not sufficient to uh, convince me that you understand what a penis, what penis envy is. But if you provided one, I'd you know be open to reading that. Let's move on to masculinity complex. I've never even heard of this before. I've heard of masculinity and femininity inferiority complex, um, which refers to women who be you know. So femininity inferiority complex is you know an obvious term that refers to when women become masculine because they have been made to feel as though femininity is inferior. Uh, so is, does she have a masculinity complex? Yeah, maybe, you know, or does she have a, sorry, a femininity inferior inferiority complex? Yeah. I mean, you could, you could make an argument for that. Tomboyism. I, I've, I'd never even heard that term before. I, I looked it up. It actually is kind of a term that some people use again, not a disorder as any of these things are. Um, it's, it, it it's not a mental illness to dress and act like a, a culturally, different gender than you are uh, or what people say you are. And so I don't know why we have to label someone as a tomboy. As a child, she tried to conform to female norms. She, as a child, she was actually very much trying to be uh, a proper lady. She was ridiculed though, because everyone thought she was too tall and too ugly. In the books, they describe her as much more ugly as they portray her on the TV show. In the TV show, she's actually attractive. You know, Gwendolyn Christie is a, you know, she's a pretty lady. But in the books, she, in fact, when I saw the actress who was going to play Brienne, I was like, oh no. I mean, she's tall and she seems fierce, but she's not ugly enough. (laughs) I mean, the vision I had in my mind when I was reading the books, I was like, boy, this woman must be, you know, pretty ugly. And I think, you know, if they cast a uglier character i think it i think it would have been more compelling but of course it's a tv show and so you know in the same way that theon Greyjoy in the books after being tortured is is a disgusting human being i mean he's lost most of his teeth lost most of his fingers most of his toes he his hair has gone white he's lost you know 30 pounds he he doesn't walk right he doesn't look right he looks 60 years, he looks 40 years older. Well, in the TV show, he looks exactly the same <laughs> because if you deformed him, it'd be hard to look at him, you know? And so TV shows usually do that. But anyway, so as a child, she tried to conform to female norms, but uh, she, everyone made fun of her because she was ugly and tall. So she started to fight people and she found that she was good at fighting people. And so she tried to fight in tournaments and stuff and she was good. So she stuck with that and she became perhaps the best knight in all of Westeros. So that's her progression into that. It has nothing to do with her psychology or, you know, any mental illness or what we might call tomboyism or something. It's just, you know, she, she deep down probably wants to fit into society, but they didn't let her fit in. So she, she decided to do something else, you know? Um, 
Now, some might say that she has gender dysphoria, which is in the DSM-5, but if you know what that looks like, you know that she doesn't have gender dysphoria. She's a heterosexual cisgender woman who decided to become a knight because that gave her self-esteem because everyone was making fun of how tall and ugly she was. It'd be like if a woman decided to join the NFL and she was one of the best linebackers in the league. Is that a mental illness? No. Is that gender dysphoria? No. Is it tomboyism or a femininity inferiority complex? I wouldn't say. Is it penis envy? I mean, I, I don't know why we have to apply any of these labels to it. So in conclusion, Brienne does not have any evidence of mental illness. She She's been traumatized a lot as being bullied and whatnot. Does she have issues? Does she have self-esteem issues? Does she have, I don't know, self-worth issues? You know, maybe, but that's not mental illness. Those, all of us have self-esteem issues to some extent. All right, let's take a break. And when we get back, let's go to Cersei Lannister. My God, this episode is going to take forever. I'm only on the letter C. Oh my God, let's take a break. <music> Okay, we're back on the from the break. We're going to talk about Cersei. We're only on the letter C, and this episode I have now decided is probably going to take five hours. So, <laughs> oh boy, I hate doing part episodes. I don't know why I hate doing episodes in parts, but because you know when you find part two and you're like, wait, where's part one? I I, I don't like that as a consumer of podcasts. I'd rather just like have it all in one file, I guess. And so I've always done just one files. Anyway, uh, also, before talking about Cersei Lannister again, become a patron. Please go to patreon.com. Support the podcast. Support art. Support your stuff. I'm not calling this art, by the way, but a lot of people are doing art on Patreon. But support podcasts, you know. I do this. It takes me hours and hours and hours to, especially for an episode like this, to prep. And so the only reason why I'm doing this and the only reason why I'm dedicating all this time is because about 500 of you or 400 of you have become patrons of this podcast. And so uh, that justifies me taking time away from my practice, essentially, to dedicate all of this time to you. All right, Cersei Lannister, whatculture.com. Let's see what they say. Whatculture.com says about Cersei. Narcissistic personality disorder with Machiavellian tendencies. They write, It's a textbook case of narcissistic personality disorder. She is almost completely consumed by a pathological need for power, success, and status, and has precisely zero problem stepping on whomever she needs to in order to get it. She has a complete lack of empathy. She is cruel, self-obsessed, controlling, haughty, power-hungry, exploitative, and ruthless. Okay, so let's look into this. What do I say? Well, sort of. Uh, But I would say not really. But, you know, one could make the argument for narcissistic personality disorder. But let's look at the criteria here. A grandiose sense of self-importance. Again, as I said earlier, when we talk about personality disorders, these are hard things for clinicians to understand, let alone someone who's looking it up on the internet or listening to a podcast about it. So, What differentiates grandiose sense of self-importance from, you know, someone who does not have narcissistic personality disorders to someone who does? This is a very difficult thing to describe and understand. But does Cersei Lannister have a grandiose self uh, sense of self-importance, like exaggerating achievements, exaggerating talents, you know, like... I uh, invented the internet, for instance. (laughs) You know, that's one exaggerated achievement. You know, you did not invent the internet. Um, Or expects to be recognized as superior without the commensurate achievements. So, you know, you're, I don't know. Let's see, you're, you're not a very fast runner, but you expect people to think of you as the fastest runner on the planet. Okay, that's, that's, there's something wrong wrong with you if if that's how it is you know does cersei exhibit this behavior no she is the effing queen of westeros the society worships her and she doesn't exaggerate anything so 
She has no grandiose sense that she, you know, she is self-important. She's the queen. So, and before she was the queen, she was a princess or a, you know, a lady or whatever they call it, you know, in the house Lannister. She was, um, you know, a daughter of Tywin Lannister, one of the most powerful men in the known world. So, does she have a grandiose sense of self-importance? No, she's queen. She, everyone says she's important. She does have importance. Okay, number two, preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. Again, in my opinion, we're talking about Eye of the Beholder, but no, she doesn't meet this criteria. Again, she's the effing queen of Westeros. She already has power. She didn't want any more power than that. Everything started to go downhill for her when she was forced to marry Robert, who didn't even like her. And he also beat her. So uh, she turned to Jamie for comfort. And they had three kids, maybe by accident, I'm not sure. And when John Aaron and Eddard threatened to out her secrets, which would have resulted in her death and the death of her children, because King Robert would have killed her and killed the children, when, when John Aaron and Eddard Stark threatened to out her, she did what, what it would, she at least considered what, what people would consider to do, which is to kill John Aaron and kill Eddard Stark, which is what she did to protect, her, protect herself. She was ruthless, and she exhibited a, a several um, degrees of lack of empathy and remorse. But if you understand her circumstances, you see that her back was, a, was up against the wall. Now, later, she kills all those people with wildfire, not in the books, but in the TV show. But again, she was facing the likelihood of imprisonment or death. Again, her back was up against the wall. If anything, she has antisocial personality disorder because she doesn't seem to care about the people that she harms. But in my opinion, she's just trying to preserve her own life and the lives of her children, which is what everyone would do. And particularly in this world, I mean, this world is a brutal, ruthless place. And a lot of people in her shoes would have done the same. So does this mean she have, she has narcissistic personality disorder? Uh, In my opinion, no. Although a lot of people thought she had narcissistic personality disorder. If you want to call her narcissistic, then fine. You know, it, if, if you want to call her mean and unkind and self-centered, then fine. But that's not narcissistic personality disorder. Although you could argue that she had traits of narcissistic personality disorder because she lacked empathy. She was arrogant. She did look down on other people. And she did consider Jamie to be the only one worthy of her love. And in the books, he, look, he looks exactly like her. When they were kids, no one could tell the difference between them. So she's you know, self-centered enough that she only thinks that Jamie is worthy of her love. Although she did actually love Robert before he became a dick to her. Um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, you could make the argument for narcissism. You could even make the argument for narcissistic personality, but honestly, when you clinically encounter people with narcissistic personality disorder, they don't present the way Cersei does. And again, that's just one of those things you're just going to have to believe me on because, Again, personality disorders are extremely complex and hard to describe. I guarantee you've probably run across someone with narcissistic personality disorder, but you probably didn't know that that's what it was. Uh, it's a very particular presentation. Um, maybe I'll do an episode on that. In fact, I, I know I will at some point because it's a hot topic in today's media. All right, let's see what MTV.com says about Cersei Lannister. Again, actual clinician being interviewed. The clinician diagnosed her with borderline, not borderline personality disorder, just the word borderline. (laughs) She over-identifies with her children. This is what they're saying. She over-identifies with her children, especially Joffrey, and is complicit in helping him stay in power because it helps her stay important. But you can see it most clearly in her relationship with Jamie. It's an I hate you, don't leave me. They push pull back and forth. And of course, their sexual relationship. Borderlines gravitate toward risky behavior, anything that releases endorphins, risky sex, gambling, drugs. The brain registered these, registers these things as solutions rather than risks. Uh, end of quote. Uh, what would I say about borderline? You know, maybe. But if you understand the history of Cersei, you would know that her reasons for being like this 
is uh, there are reasons. And, you know, you, you should listen to my long episode in which I did, uh, I don't know, a couple hours on Cersei. Uh, she was um, very close to Jamie for some very justifiable reasons. Um, also, she wasn't overly emotional when betrayed. She never decompensated. You know, she gets revenge like the way Arya does, but that's not borderline. Getting revenge, you know, isn't isn't necessarily borderline. When w- w- people with borderline personality disorder, when they're betrayed, they become emotionally unhinged because they've been traumatized. Remember how I said you fall off a roof? There's a lot of different diagnoses that can happen. Well, when you become traumatized, one of the things that can happen is you can develop borderline personality disorder. So, and um, I consider it um, at its at its uh, base a traumatic reaction. And so, when you are rejected, even even the hint of a possible rejection as an adult, it triggers those childhood deep, deep childhood traumas regarding being rejected and abandoned as a, or abused as a, as a child um, over time. And you start to re-experience all those feelings of just being empty and alone and not good enough and angry and hurt and afraid and just all those things. And then you, you decompensate emotionally and you know your personality becomes unhinged and you become extremely emotionally erratic and upset and you might get angry and stuff. Cersei never did that. She, there was no decompensation from Cersei. She was very calm and cool and collected. Well, being borderline, having borderline personality disorder is not typically associated with being calm and cool and collected. It's really the opposite. So, um, so again, uh, borderline personality disorder doesn't really fit the, the bill. Uh, but in the books, she is much more paranoid than she exhibits in the TV show, particularly when Tommen was king. She's totally convinced that many people are out to betray her, which is, you know, it's a minor sign of borderline personality. But really, if you have any experience with borderline, you would know that she doesn't fit the profile. So MTV.com, borderline, conclusion, uh, stupid. <laughs> uh, so, um... So what's the, what's the, uh, the final, th- oh no, there's a couple other, uh, there's, there's another website here, a blog of Thrones. What does the blog of Thrones say? They say alcoholism because of excessive and compulsive drinking that leads to psychological and physical addiction. Unquote me, uh, that's sort of old language, but you know, the psychological and physical addiction bit, but you know, it's fine. Also, uh, it's, it's not called alcoholism in the DSM. It's called alcohol use disorder. Um, but we don't really know if she was actually addicted. It's, it's hard to say, uh, but I'll get more into that in a second. I think, um, what do, so in conclusion about Cersei, Cersei suffers from antisocial personality disorder or what we might call that's not in the DSM psychopathic personality disorder. However, her diagnosis presentation her diagnostic presentation is com- is complicated by the fact that she's a woman who has been continually marginalized and abused, most notably by her father and her husband, and p- kind of by society. Also, she is surrounded by a context that values power, specifically royal power. So her psychopathic antisocial behavior could be a result of circumstances and culture rather than her personality. Most of her major antisocial acts have been instrumental in gaining power and could be considered acts of survival from her perspective. She also suffered from alcohol use disorder since she appeared to drink every day throughout the day, but it's hard to say uh, if she had any ill effects from her drinking, which is a criterion for the disorder of alcohol use disorder. But that's really common to fictional depictions of alcohol use. They rarely show any negative effects, uh, you know, people like Tyrion is there one time you show he, they showed a negative effect is when he vomited. <laughs> um, that one time when he was, when he landed in, you know, across the narrow sea, Bravosi, I think they were in anyway, the rest of the time, they just never show any ill effects, you know, Tyrion and, and Cersei are drinking wine all the time. And they, they seem to get a little bit more lush. <laughs> they seem to get a little bit more bold, and um, 
and cynical when they drink, which, you know, might be something that people do when they drink. But in the movies, they rarely show like the reality of, of alcoholism, um, you know, that it actually uh, produces slurred speech, bad choices, difficulty thinking, massive hangovers, uh, just compulsive drinking in the face of consequences, not making any sense, losing your temper. You know, there's a lot of things that you see in the real world with uh, persistent alcohol use that you just don't see in, in depictions and fictional depictions, probably because it's just not fun to see that, I guess. I don't know the way they portray drinking in the, in the movies and TV shows. It always just seems so glamorous, you know, it's like, Oh, that sounds fun. I'm going to be Tyrion and I'm going to be, you know, King of wine (laughs) or what does he call himself? King of wine and tits or something. So getting back to Cersei, some might label Cersei as suffering from borderline or narcissistic personality disorder or some other personality disorder. But in my opinion, she is, you know, for the most part below the threshold that is required for those labels. So in conclusion, Cersei, there's really not any evidence, not enough evidence for any mental disorder. Antisocial borderline narcissistic personality traits but not the full order, full, full disorders. You know, she certainly exhibited a lack of empathy and, and harm to other people. She exhibited some uh, sensitivity to rejection and some push pull with Jamie. She exhibits some self-centeredness, but she, in my opinion, does not fit the full criteria for those disorders. Again, it's particularly the the one you could say is antisocial, but again, when you look at her specific choices, and I didn't go through the books again, uh, but from my memory in the in the books and her decisions, she she made a lot of decisions that uh, made sense to her survival, and and again, sometimes she was being threatened with death, or at the very least, uh, a life of servitude or being a poor person somewhere, you know, so. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say she has any sort of personality disorder. Does she have alcohol use disorder? Probably, but th- the books just don't give us enough data to make that decision. You know, could she stop at any time? Ha- you know, d- does she actually drink all day, every day? Is it presenting any negative effects for her? Um, it's just, you know, they don't th- give us enough data. So in conclusion, Cersei, no diagnosis, but antisocial borderline narcissistic traits and a very good possibility for alcohol use disorder. Okay. Let's go on to Daenerys. Finally at the letter D. How long is this episode going to take? Um, what culture.com says that Daenerys is sane. They say, despite her gene pool being as shallow as a bird bath. I like that line. She is as well adjusted as she is as well adjusted as you could hope for a woman who has been sold by her brother, gave birth to a deformed dead baby, and owns a trio of dragons. As a powerful queen, she is inevitably she is inevitably a bit forceful, but not mentally ill. Uh, MTV also said she's sane. She's not narcissistic, and she's very empath- em- empathic, she sa- they say. Psychology Today also gives no diagnosis to Daenerys. They say, She's one of the most stable, well-adjusted characters in the Game of Thrones universe. She isn't overly anxious, doesn't have multiple personalities, and doesn't suffer too much from her, from her past trauma. So I have a confession to make. Try as I might, the DSM-5 doesn't give me anything to work with. I find that, so unquote, I find that that line is, is sort of telling, right? Psycho- the, so Psychology Today, presumably a clinician, is writing this one. I'm, I'm pretty sure on that. And this writer, they say, try as I might, I can't diagnose Daenerys with anything. I, I find that interesting. Try as I might. Why are you trying so hard to diagnose? I think that's one of the things about these websites. It's like you ask someone, okay, what, you know, what mental illness does Daenerys suffer from? Like there's this compulsion to like just come up with something. Uh, you know, how, how about be a clinician and say she, it's fine. She doesn't have anything, you know, like why, why do you have to do that? Uh, if anything, you should be extremely conservative when doling out complicated labels like, you know, personality disorders. So 
what's my opinion? Yeah, I agree. There's no evidence of mental illness. I suspect that everyone is being uh, very careful about diagnosing Daenerys because they like her. That's the, and because the, she just doesn't show any of the kind of triggers that would cause people to diagnose. But I find it interesting that no one on the internet that I was looking at all these various sites, that no one is discussing that she might have narcissistic personality. If Cersei and Alistair are so clearly narcissistic to people, then why not Daenerys? Daenerys is just as power hungry as Cersei, if not more. Daenerys kills a lot of people to gain power. Now, she also uh, frees a lot of slaves, does a lot of what we would consider to be morally good things. But, you know, she's done, she's killed a lot of people all because she wants to rule Westeros. Uh, you know, she is hell bent on killing people so that she can uh, go back to Westeros to kill a bunch more people so that she can sit because she wants to sit in the Iron Throne, you know, because she deserves it. And that no one is talking about narcissism in that. I mean, I wouldn't say she's narcissistic, but with all the loose talk on the internet about narcissism, why is there zero talk about Daenerys being narcissistic? It's just interesting. I think it's because people like her, and, you know, and again, it, it shows that when you don't like someone, you want to diagnose them. All right. Grand Maester Pycelle, Grand Maester Pycelle. Uh, he is the, the sort of, asshole uh, maester. A blog of thrones says malinger quote, a person that fakes illness or exaggerates symptoms for personal gain or to avoid work and duty. Uh, unquote. What would I say? Yes, he is malingering, but malinger is not a diagnosis. The term in the DSM is factitious disorder uh, imposed on the self. And as I was preparing to talk about Grand Ma Maester Pycelle, I realized that I screwed up the Munchausen by Proxy episode in which I talked about Munchausen by Proxy. And I also talked about that documentary, Mommy, Dead and Dearest, because I kept saying, Mun I kept saying factitious disorder imposed by another. And I didn't like that. And I, and I even, I think I even said once, I was like, why isn't it called imposed on another? And it is imposed on another <laughs> because of course it's called that because that's what makes sense. And, uh, I'm, I'm an idiot because I kept railing on a name that I didn't realize it was, I was guilty of one of the things that I am blasting people for, which is, you know, not accurately reading the DSM. And, um, you know, I just want to face palm and, uh, do that Napoleon dynamite line idiot or idiot, you know, anyway, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, so the technical term DSM factitious disorder imposed on the self grand maester pie cell, but he doesn't seem to have factitious disorder because he's not presenting as such. And if you want to know more, listen to my Munchausen by proxy episode for more information about that. It, it's just because you're faking an illness doesn't mean that you qualify for a factitious. Factitious is, is kind of a specific thing. It's usually, factitious is usually reserved for people who are doing it compulsively and strangely, and there's not really any, right. they might get some gain from it, but it's not, doesn't really make a lot of sense as to why they do it. Grandmaster Pycelle acts like he is old and rickety because I think, you know, he wants to manipulate other people to, uh, to, to go easy on him, think of, you know, to think of him as this frail, you know, simple old man and therefore worthy of, you know, other people's uh, compassion. And uh, at least that's what I think. Um, and I, I might, it, there's some things I could be getting the books and TV shows mixed up on. I know that they portray this in the TV show, but, uh, and I'm pretty sure they portray it in the book too. But anyway, so diagnosis for a Grand Maester Pycelle, uh, there's, there's no evidence for any mental illness, but is he faking an illness, uh, a.k.a. malingering? Uh, we would say yes. Sir Gregor Clegane, The Mountain, a blog of thrones, calls him sadism, a person who enjoys inflicting pain on others. Uh, and what do I say? Yes, a blog of thrones, you are correct, sadism. We know that he was abusive to his little brother, Sandor Clegane, the Hound, 
And he and his men repeat it. So this is in the books, by the way. So in the TV show, they don't show this, uh, but at least I don't think they did. But in the, in the books, he and his men, the mountain men, I think they were called, he and his men repeatedly and brutally raped several innocent girls and women in the books, uh, which is, again, not depicted in the TV show. And he killed Prince Rhaegar and his baby by dashing the baby's head against the wall. And it's rumored that he killed his father. And it's rumored that he killed his first two wives. And it's rumored that he killed many of his servants. And he didn't seem to have any hesitation or remorse about these actions. So I would say definitely the label of antisocial personality disorder would be justified. Sadistic personality disorder, which is not in the DSM, would also be justified. And sexual sadism disorder would also be justified. Sexual sadism, sadism disorder, which is a, one, of the, one of the paraphilias. But again, it's hard to tell if he's just following orders and purposely being scary because that's part of his job is to be scary and violent. Um, but I, I think uh, given what we understand about, you know, at least the rumored, if the rumors are true, then, uh, and even some of the things that we absolutely know, I mean, you know, randomly finding girls, little girls, like 13 year old girls and, and, you know, young women and, and just gang raping them. That's, you know, that's sick. Uh, it's disturbed behavior, definitely antisocial, definitely sadistic and definitely sexual sadistic. Um, he, the mountain is one of the most, he's one of the worst people in the books, uh, up there with Ramsey. He is, he is a horrible, horrible human being. All right. Jamie Lannister. A lot of people have opinions about what he is suffering from. Whatculture.com claims him to be sane. Uh, again, we don't use, or not again, but we don't use the term sane or insane. That's, um, there's some legal terms about sanity, but, uh, that's not a that's not a term we tend to use in mental health. Uh, we would say that he doesn't meet criteria for any mental illness or a diagnosis in the DSM. Uh, so what culture says? No diagnosis. MTV.com says narcissist uh, and doesn't really provide any justification. They just say he comes from a family of narcissists. A blog of thrones.com narcissism. When a person has an inflated sense of their own importance and complete disregard towards others, often seeing them as inferior to them. Okay, what do I say about Jamie Lannister? Well, these other websites, mtv.com, blogofthrones.com, they're not saying narcissistic personality disorder. They're not using that entire phrase. They're just saying narcissist or narcissism. So it's fine for them to use those terms since they're not technical diagnoses. You know, anyone can call someone narcissistic, for instance. If, if that's what they think makes sense to them, but that's, and, and I, as a clinician, am not going to, you know, uh, wag my finger at that because that's not a technical term. Uh, and there's no clear standardized definition of what that means. So, you know, anyone can do that. You know, it's like calling someone a jerk, you know, you're a jerk. Well, as a diagnostician, I'm not going to say, you know, what's the criteria for jerk? <laughs> you know, it's just like, fine, it's a word, whatever. So these, these, now these websites are claiming to be diagnosing and they're, they're just saying narcissist. He's, I'm going to diagnose him as a narcissist. <laughs> so, so, you know, my God, it's so dumb, but, um, but does he have narcissistic personality disorder, which I think is what these people are trying to say. Again, context is everything. He was raised in a society that worshiped him. So when he exhibits his self-importance, he's just doing what society taught him to do and what, and what society kind of wants him to do. Also, he wasn't obsessed with, with bragging about himself and making everyone admire him. So uh, at least from my memory from the books, he wasn't like super obsessed with making everyone admire him all the time. So, and again, if you understand actual presentations, full-blown narcissistic personality disorder, you know that Jamie Lannister does not fit that those criteria. Is he self-centered like Cersei? Yeah. Is he, could he? Would we all like him, particularly in the beginning of the books, to take it down a notch? For sure. Would we all like him to have empathy? Absolutely. But you know, he's raised in a world and in, in a family and in a context in which you know there's. There's, there's the people who matter and there's the people who don't. And he was just following those, those protocols. It, you know, in some ways, uh, you could say that uh, he was quite um, noble and, and chivalrous when he decided to kill the Mad King, you know. 
Uh, but anyway, so in conclusion, I would say Jamie Lannister, no evidence of mental disorder. Let's, let's not, let's not overdiagnose everybody. All right, let's take a break. And when we get back, we'll get to the letter. Uh, we'll continue with the letter J. <laughs> Okay, we're back from the break. Continuing after talking about Jamie Lannister, let's talk about Jaqen Hagar. Thoughtcatalog.com. This is a new, a new player in our field here. Thoughtcatalog.com. They say Jack Han- Hagar has dissociative identity disorder. And uh, this, this site actually provides treatment plans. Treatment plan, 25 appointments with a psychologist, allowing multiple identities to be consolidated, they said. <laughs> okay, to you clinicians out there, I just want to read this because it's so, so dumb. Okay, so thoughtcatalog.com diagnoses Jack and Agar with dissociative identity disorder <laughs> and a treatment plan of 25 appointments with a psychologist, a al- uh, allowing multiple identities to be consolidated. <laughs> okay. Again, this episode is already too long. Uh, I'm not going to go into dissociative identity disorder uh, uh, that that much, but um, and treatment plans. But I just have to say, like, my God, that's that's so stupid. Um, 25 appointments is way not enough for dissociative identity disorder. If you truly thought someone had that. Uh, and then the 25 appointments with a psychologist. Well, what about all the other mental health professionals who are qualified to treat dissociative identity disorder? Um, and then, and then just applying the the label dissociative identity disorder to Jack and Agar, uh, just you know, just dumb, just uh, just stupid. Okay, Joffrey Baratheon, um, <laughs> whatculture.com. What what does what what culture what culture.com have to say about Joffrey Bar- Baratheon? They say. Sociopath with sadistic tendencies. They say Joffrey is completely devoid of empathy and takes active enjoyment in the violation and harm of others. Well, what do I say? Uh, well, sociopath is not a preferred term. People don't use the term in the in the mental health world. Uh, antisocial personality disorder is used, and sometimes people use psychopathy or psychopathic personality disorder. But yes, if 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 uh, whatculture.com is saying antisocial with sadism, absolutely. Uh, anti he's he is Joffrey Baratheon is super antisocial and super sadistic. Uh, but you know we wouldn't apply that label because he's not eighteen. I think he dies at the age of thirteen, and so in the field we would label him as conduct disorder because that's the childhood version of antisocial uh, for the most part. A blog of thrones.com, they say antisocial personality disorder. So whatculture.com and a blog of thrones.com, they get it right. MTV.com, what do they say? The clinical sociopath, they say. Clinical sociopath. Um, I love it when people use the term clinical as if other diagnoses are unclinical, you know, like clinical depression. <laughs> it just shows that they're ignorant of our lingo. MTV.com, clinic, the clinical sociopath. So not only are they using that stupid term clinical, but they're also using the term sociopath. It's like, uh, I mean, whatever. But, you know, in essence, they're right. So Psychology Today says antisocial personality disorder, uh, but realistically, Joffrey would have been diagnosed with conduct disorder. So Psychology Today was the, the most accurate although they weren't always accurate. What would I say? Yeah, Joff- Joffrey suffered from antisocial personality disorder as well as sadistic personality disorder, which is not in the DSM-5, specifically tyrannical sadism in that he relished in verbally and physically harming and abusing others with his power. However, since personality disorders are commonly relegated to only adults and not minors, most current clinicians would apply the label of conduct disorder because he exhibited a pattern of violating the rights of others as a young person. His disorder may have developed from the abuse that he experienced from his father, Robert Baratheon. Uh, he also had a distant mother, I'm guessing. You know, we could imagine Cersei wasn't all that close and warm. Uh, Joffrey also experienced trauma from, from his parents fighting all the time. It's something, obviously, they didn't show on the TV show, but... Uh, they refer to it in the books that, you know, Joffrey experienced as a young child, 
his parent, uh, Robert Baratheon and Cersei were fighting all the time and it was violent. It got, it got ugly. And Robert was, uh, very violent with Cersei. Um, also that something that's not really portrayed in TV show is Joffrey looked like a girl and he was being teased because he looked like a girl. Also inbreeding might have an effect on the development of sadism and antisocial. Also his mother drank while he, she was pregnant in all likelihood and that might have had an effect, you know. There's not a real, there's not a ton of solid research on that, but you know, you never know. Also, growing up, he was heir to the throne of Westeros, and he's being told he's better than other people. And you know, we know real cases where children are spoiled in this way and can develop antisocial uh, these traits. Um, also we can imagine that his parenting conditions were also great. So there are a lot of reasons why Joffrey developed his, his, uh, issues, his conduct disorder, which makes me believe that if given enough time and, and, and enough love and enough attention and enough good, uh, enough good environment, he could have pulled himself out of it. It's just a guess, but who knows? Ramsey, on the other hand, in the mountain, they're far gone. There's nothing that could be done. <laughs> Um, so in conclusion, Joffrey Baratheon, yeah, antisocial personality disorder, sadistic personality disorder, and sexual sadism disorder. And if you want to hear my full analysis, listen to the full episode on Joffrey Baratheon. That was my very first Game of Thrones episode. Uh, I don't know why I did it, but uh, I just wanted to do Joffrey. And as soon as I posted it, everyone was like, oh, you got to do Ramsey and you got to do this person. And so this episode is kind of in response to everyone wanting me to do all the, <laughs> all the characters. Okay. Jon Snow. Let's go to Jon Snow. Whatculture.com says seasonal affective disorder. <laughs> and let me uh, quote them here. Depression run Depression runs in John's family with a strong tendency for melancholy running through the Stark DNA. He has a depressive affect and it's only been getting worse since heading north. Seasonal affective disorder is a type of depression that worsens during the winter months with reduced sunlight and colder weather. Early on, he can be found laughing and joking with his family in the comparatively temp temperate environment of Winterfell, but as winter draws in, and the nights get darker, so does his outlook, unquote. All right, what do I say? This is stupid. Um, there's no evidence of this disorder. The technical term is major depressive disorder with, with seasonal pattern, and let's go over the criteria here. Okay, first off, uh, for major depression, a depressed mood, meaning feeling sad, feeling empty, feeling hopeless, uh, appearing like you're down. Uh, there's no evidence that Jon Snow what, had a depressed mood. Uh, di diminished interest and pleasure in things that n you were normally interested in. No, he's he is highly motivated in his work. He is one of those non-depressed people in the, in the books. I mean, he, look at all the things he does. Depressed people have a hard time getting out of bed in the morning, let alone taking on the world the way Jon Snow is. So no, he, he is, uh, he is definitely interested in getting his job done and saving the world. So I wouldn't say he has diminished interest. If anything, he has an increased interest in, in taking action on things. Weight change. There's no evidence of that. Sleep problems. I don't see any evidence of that. Psychomotor agitation or retardation. Absolutely no evidence of that. Fatigue. I don't see any evidence of that. Feelings of worthlessness, no evidence. Difficulty concentrating, no evidence. Suicidality, you know, actual suicidality, not, you know, the kind of stuff that you just do in the course of war. Uh, no, no evidence of wanting to kill himself. Significant distress from all these things, no. Okay, seasonal pattern, depressive episodes that coincide with seasons. No, since he doesn't have any depressive episodes. Full remission for part of the year. Uh, no. In the last two years, two major depressive episodes. No. So even if he did have major depression, which he doesn't, even if he did, you couldn't give him 
uh, seasonal affective disorder, otherwise known as a seasonal pattern to major depressive disorder, because he, he hasn't exhibited enough cycles back and forth to know what's happening. If you just want to, if you wanted to say major depression, then fine, it's still wrong. But uh, there's no, if, even if he did have major depression, you would have no idea if it's, if his depression is going to go away once it becomes summer again, because you haven't seen him in the next summer so that you would know if he has a seasonal pattern to his depression. If he was depressed, maybe this is just the beginning of his depression and then he just stays depressed for the rest of his life, regardless of the seasons or the seasons have nothing to do with his cycles. So I just have to say, um, you know, seasonal affective disorder uh, is, is up there as one of the dumbest things I saw on the internet. His life has been really tough. You know, his adoptive mother and father, uh, Caitlin and, and Eddard, they're dead. His beloved brother, uh, Rob, dead. Beloved sisters, presumed dead. Beloved, uh, you know, younger brothers, Bran and Rickon, presumed killed by Theon, who was supposed to be a friend. Beloved girlfriend, killed by his friends. You know, Jon Snow, you know nothing. He's betrayed by Theon. Winterfell is burned by Ramsay, and so many people are killed. There's a huge army of white walkers that are coming to kill everyone and no one is trying to stop it. And many of his brothers in arms are killed by various different people and so on and so on. These are terrible, demoralizing, depressing things. And in spite of that, he has persisted. He's the opposite of depressed. He's highly motivated. He must be at least, you know, partially optimistic because otherwise why would he fight if i was john snow i would have gave up long ago i would have become depressed and just been like uh what's the point you know uh, we're all gonna die and no one's helping and my own men are trying to kill me and and they did kill me and now i'm back to life so yeah, uh, is he depressed? Does he have major depressive disorder? I would say no. And, you know, don't be stupid. Okay, MTV.com. Guess what MTV, you know, so far MTV.com has been the dumbest of all, even though they're talking to a clinician. So what could we imagine at MTV.com? Let's say, well, again, seasonal affective. Not seasonal affective disorder, just the phrase seasonal affective. <laughs> seasonal affective what? Seasonal affective joy. Seasonal affective... Uh, happiness, or you know, it's like what um, they say. If anyone in Westeros has brain-based, biology-based mental health issues, I'd say that depression runs in the Stark family. It's just a weird. It's a weird phrase. If anyone in Westeros has brain-based, biology, biology-based mental health issues, I'd say that depression runs in Stark in the Stark family. Sansa is clearly depressed. She has a depressed depressed affect. Caitlin had that too at times. And Jon Snow, he's experienced a lot of loss, which is a trigger for depression. And it's also common for people displaced from home to experience depressive episodes. It might even be seasonally effective living that far north. Um, okay, end of quote, me. Yeah, stupid. Uh, this is a clinician talking. Uh, sure, he's been through a lot and he's grieving and that's made him sad. You know, that's, that's grief. But that does not mean he has major depressive disorder, and it definitely doesn't effing mean he has major depressive disorder with seasonal pattern. I mean, don't be stupid, people. You're just throwing around these these um, terms as if, you know, you know what they mean, and you don't. You know, stop it. You don't know these things. So get out of my kitchen. If you want to... If you want to talk about Jon Snow's personality and he's like, oh, he seems kind of down or he seems kind of, uh, you know, forlorn or uh, his motivations are funny or, you know, whatever. Fine. Great. You're, you're, you're just as good at that as any clinician is. You can, you can wax and wane or what do you call it? You can, you can, as, you can talk as much as you want about personality and motivation and character arc and what, what, you know, what's deep down in him and if you can relate to that. Yes, go for it. I love that stuff. In fact, uh, I watched that TV show that's right after Game of Thrones. It, you know, there's a there's a TV show that comes. At, so if, you know, when you when a new Game of Thrones episode comes out, immediately after there's this 
there's I, there's this TV show on, I think it's HBO that talks about the episode, these people. And um, I love all that stuff. But if you're going to come into my world, the mental health world, and you're going to start throwing around these terms, um, stop it because you clearly do not know what you're doing, internet. Uh, you just you just don't know what you're doing, okay? Okay, uh, what is a blog of throne? Okay, so uh, whatculture.com, seasonal affective disorder, uh, just dumb. MTV, seasonal affective dot, 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 also dumb. A blog of thrones, martyr complex. Martyr complex, uh, it goes on. Also known as victim complex, when a person exaggerates his own suffering and or persecutions, wanting to become a martyr for his own sake. In some cases, attributing their persecution to the exceptional ability of their own. John being skillful, John John being a skillful castle trained highborn bastard puts him at odds with the rest of the Night's Watch when he first takes the black. Period. End of quote. All right. Uh, yeah, this is not a DSM label, martyr complex or victim complex, uh, but you know it's an in- interesting analysis. There are a number of times that Jon Snow actually puts himself in harm's way in a very public manner. And we might call this a martyr complex, or we might call this masochism. He's always volunteering for these extremely risky jobs. He went by himself to the wildlings when they were about to attack the wall, which was very risky and very public. He had been treated uh, somewhat badly by the people growing up uh, in his life. I mean, you know, he's sort of a second rate citizen at, you know, at Winterfell, particularly when it came to Caitlin, his adoptive mother. And, you know, when you have those kinds of experiences early in life and you're treated badly, you, you internalize that relationship and it becomes a difficult internalized representational relationship in, inside your psyche. And so you sometimes to cope with that as a defense, you end up abusing yourself through society or sort of making other people know that you're being abused in some way. I, I could go on and on and on, but Anyway, a blog of thrones, the, uh, because a martyr complex is not a DSM, uh, thing, um, you know, and because, uh, f- if I'm understanding what a blog of thrones writer is saying, um, sure you can say that. And there's no criteria. It's all in the eye of the beholder in that one. So, uh, and I can even sort of agree with it. All right. Next person, Jorah Mormont. Jorah Mormont. What does a blog of thrones say? They say obsessive love. That's the diagnosis. That's his mental illness. Obsessive love. They say a state of mind in which a person feels an obsessive desire to possess a person to whom they feel strong attraction with the inability to accept rejection from that very same person. Jorah has proved it many times that he is obsessed with Daenerys Targaryen, even saving her in the fighting pits of Marine. Unquote. What do I say about this? Uh, stupid. This is not a diagnosis. Obsessive love is not a diagnosis. It's not a mental illness as it's presented in this article. Jorah Mormont just merely loves her. That's not an obsession. If you understand what obsessions are, you understand this is not obsession. It's just he just loves her. He's fond of her. He's dedicated to her. And for a time, he's her knight and he's trying to do his job and he feels bad about being excommunicated from his homeland. So he's, you know, he's trying to be a dutiful guy. And yeah, he loves, he loves Jorah. So uh, that's not a mental illness. If, if that is, then uh, 99% of people on the planet have a mental illness called obsessive love because everyone has that experience in life. Um, All right. So, uh, in conclusion, Jorah Marmot, any mental illness? No, of course not. You know, don't be stupid. Okay. Lysa Aaron, Lysa Aaron. Uh, a lot of people have a lot to say about Lysa. Whatculture.com says borderline personality disorder. Uh, and what I would say is yes, this time they're right. She is actually a good example of one particular presentation of borderline personality disorder, but to be clear, most people with borderline personality disorder do not look like Lysa Aaron. Uh, she, she's an example of it, but she's not a, uh, an all-encompassing example of it. What does MTV.com say? Paranoid personality disorder and Munchausen by proxy. Uh, and what I would say is, yeah, um, you know, I, I, it's, actually people are getting this right. Um, uh, you know, paranoid personality disorder, I would say, is a possible differential when it comes to borderline personality disorder and Lysa Aaron, you know, could be, but I think borderline is a better diagnosis. 
But, you know, one can make the argument for paranoid personality disorder. And the Munchausen by proxy is possible. Again, we call that fictitious disorder imposed on other. Uh, you know, the way she treated her son, you know, it's possible. Uh, but I wouldn't say it's um, a strong presentation of Munchausen by proxy. Uh, all right. What does a blog of thrones say? They say uh, delusional jealousy or Othello syndrome. Uh, so delusional jealousy and Othello syndrome. Um, what do I have to say about that? Uh, that's stupid. Those aren't mental illnesses. I've never even heard of them. I, I, I guess I could imagine what Othello syndrome is. I guess it's referring to Othello in the Shakespearean play. Uh, delusional jealousy. No, Lysa Aaron is not delusional. Uh, she's jealous, but she's not delusional. She's justifiably jealous. <laughs> and uh, uh, Othello syndrome. I mean, come on. Um, so conclusion about Lysa Aaron. Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, a good a good candidate for borderline personality disorder. Uh, is she a typical borderline personality? Uh, no, because she's, um, I don't know, she's she's quite aggressive and she's quite uh, mean to people. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if, if I were to diagnose her, I would say, you know, that's a good candidate. And, and clearly, it, it, so, so actually, in relation to this other uh, talk that I'm trying to help people understand personality disorders, you never get the sense that Lysa Aaron is okay. Like, even when she is, you know, every, even when things are going well, she doesn't seem happy, right? Uh, the, the actress that plays her is just brilliant because there's always something off kilter about her. There, there's always something, she seems to be suffering all the time. Uh, she's not, she doesn't seem to be happy with herself. Uh, she, she, you know, she, she reacts very strongly to rejection. She becomes very emotionally dysregulated when uh, she's threatened by people uh, in, in a relationship way. And that's what people with personality disorders will do, uh, namely borderline personality. Well, you know, again, as I said earlier, when you are traumatized relationally and rejected, then you are very, very sensitive to rejection. And when someone rejects you, it brings back all those old feelings from when you were a very young child. And you essentially have a temper tantrum that is justified given how, how bad you feel, you know? And so uh, I shouldn't say temper tantrum. I should say meltdown. <laughs> That's a better term. Uh, you know, temper tantrums are things that I guess we do on purpose at times, or at least sometimes, but um, a child, when they melt down, you know, they're, they're coming unglued, their emotions are taking over and they're melting down. And so when you have, when you've been traumatized in a way that makes you develop borderline personality disorder and someone even hints at rejecting you, you melt down because you can't turn to internal resources to help you get through those moments to to reassure you that you're still a good person, to reassure you that you'll be okay without that person. Um, you don't have that. In the same way that a four-year-old can't turn to himself and say, well, I'll probably be okay if my parents reject me. You know, if my parents drop me off in the curve, you know, I'll be okay. You know, no four-year-old can do that. Well, when you're traumatized at in those ages, and you know, when as a young child, uh, you retain that structure of personality. And as an adult, even though you're walking and talking like an adult, you feel like a four-year-old does. And so uh, Lysa Aaron exhibited that, uh, that way of feeling. Now, the thing that, that's different about Lysa Aaron in terms of uh, the typical, you know, the vast majority of people with borderline personality disorder is that Lysa Aaron was an extremely mean individual. I mean, she had no problem you know, trying to kill Tyrion and just doing all these, and she's very strange with her son. And I actually know borderline personality disordered people who are actually great parents. So, uh, so Lysa Aaron was a particular kind of, of borderline personality. Okay. What about Melisandre? Melisandre. Whatculture.com says histrionic personality disorder. 
uh, blah, blah, blah. Let's let's see what they say. Affecting four times as many women as men, histrionic personality disorder is characterized by excessive attention-seeking behavior through the use of high drama and extravagant displays of sexuality. They crave stimulation, attention, and admiration and will use persistently manipulative means to achieve their own needs. Histrionic people will be overly emotional, theatrical, prone to rash decision-making, and likely to blame personal failures or disappointments on others, unquote. Uh, what would I say about this? This is stupid. It's, it's, it's a complete misunderstanding of histrionic personality disorder. I did, uh, I think, at least a two-hour episode on histrionic, uh, so go listen to that I want, uh, if you want to. I think it's a patron-only episode, though. Uh, she's not histrionic. She's a religious priest. Melisande is a, she's a religious priest or priestess, so everything she does is in line with her religion and her job as a priest. So uh, to call her histrionic is is completely missing the point of histrionic personality disorder. And again, if you've experienced someone with histrionic personality disorder, you know that Melisandre, Melisandre she does not present like that. What is MTV.com to, uh, to say? And again, with MTV's track record, uh, we could only imagine how stupid they're going to be. And guess what? Yeah, totally stupid. Delusional. Again, not not a diagnosis, just delusional. I uh, say, if we put magic aside, Melisandre has serious delusions of grandeur in terms of what she believes she's capable of, unquote. Okay, stupid. Yes, if she didn't have magical powers, then yeah, maybe something's wrong there, but she does have magical powers. So there's no evidence of delusions or psychosis. Don't be dumb. Uh, so conclusion, Melisandre, no evidence of mental diagnoses. She's a priest who is trying to serve her God and her king, who happens to be Stannis, which is, you know, completely normal for religious leaders in this world. So there's no mental illness for Melisande. She's, she's, she's fine. Oberyn Martell, the Viper, a blog of Thrones says sex addiction, uh, blah, blah, blah. A constant craving for the flesh that can distract a person from his tasks and duties. Uh, What do I have to say about that? Again, stupid. Uh, People love to use sex addiction as a label, and I'm getting tired of it, frankly. Over in Martell, he he likes sex. You know, many people like sex. That doesn't mean that he's a sex addict. In our world, many people like to watch football, right? In, In our world, right? In our American football. A lot of people like to watch American football, but that doesn't mean that they're football addicts. You know, uh, and just because he likes to have sex, I mean, we don't even know how much he, how much sex he was having. I mean, I suppose if he was having sex 16 hours a day, then, you know, maybe, but, uh, we don't, uh, he just, you know, he, he likes sex. He's from Dorn. They seem like a very sensual people. <laughs> um, uh, you know, of the things that these Royals were getting involved in, I would say sex is, you know, uh, one of the l- least harmful things that people were getting involved in. So is he an addict because he liked to have sex? Uh, no, that's dumb. So don't be stupid. Uh, in conclusion, Oberyn Martell, no evidence of diagnosis. Okay. Peter Littlefinger Baelish, Peter Baelish Littlefinger, Blog of Thrones says, mythomania, mythomania or patholo- pathological lying. Uh, what do I have to say about that? Stupid. The term pathological lying usually refers to people who lie for seemingly no reason or who, uh, you know, it's almost a compulsion to them. And it's usually, in my experience, the result of major attachment injuries um, and or child abuse. Littlefinger is playing the Game of Thrones, right? Just like everyone else is. But he's playing to his strengths. He's using his intellect and his guile, just like Robert Baratheon played to his strengths as a fierce warrior to become king, right? So Robert Baratheon played to his strengths with his huge hammer, and uh, Littlefinger is playing to his strengths by using his intellect. So uh, to call him a uh, myth, to, to, to call him a pathological liar is totally misunderstanding what pathological lying actually is. Pathological lying is a legit thing. Uh, uh, believe me, I, I've come across it. So, um, uh, so you know, it's legit. It's not a thing that's in the DSM, but, uh, but it's legit. Anyway, what does thoughtcatalog.com have to say? They say antisocial personality disorder. Um, 
They say he slithers his way into advantageous situations, manipulating everyone around him to get what he desires. Um, uh, they have a treatment plan because remember thought, thought catalog has treatment plan, treatment plan, extended psychotherapy and a regimen of Prozac and Zoloft. Uh, what would I have to say about what thoughtcatalog.com is saying? That's stupid. Prozac and Zoloft. I mean, are you just pulling out random pills out of your head? And that's, you know, like names that you've seen on TV and that's, and for, for antisocial personality disorder, your treatment plan is Prozac and Zoloft. That's, that's your treatment plan. Like, why are you even trying to, why, if you don't know what you're talking about, why do you even talk about it? Why don't you just say regimen of meds I've heard before? <laughs> like, Hey, good boy. Well, now extended psychotherapy, um, you know, it's, there's, it's debatable whether or not you can even help someone with antisocial, but, but there are some therapies that seem to work anyway, depending on the goal. But, um, little finger, um, clearly doesn't care about human life and he's willing to harm others for his own gain. So he does, in my opinion, so that thought catalog is saying antisocial and I'm saying, yeah, uh, you could make a case for that. But again, he is, it, it, the, the question is, is he actually psychopathic? Is he actually antisocial personality or is he just playing the game of Thrones that everyone else is trying to play? It's hard to tell. Also, another data point here is he didn't seem to exhibit any psychopathic, you know, uh, mean traits prior to Joffrey becoming queen, uh, king, you know. So when Joffrey became king, that's when uh, Littlefinger started to kind of engage in a lot of these shady behaviors, which would eventually lead to uh, uh, Littlefinger participating in the death of, of King Joffrey. So... Maybe Littlefinger's antisocial behavior is just a manifestation of his intelligent efforts to establish a good leader on the throne. You know, it's hard to tell. Uh, but similar to Cersei, uh, he he does show he 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 does show a lack of empathy and he does show a lack of remorse at the things that he has done. So at the very least, he has antisocial personality traits. So the conclusion for Littlefinger is antisocial personality disorder traits, but I don't think he has the full disorder and definitely doesn't have mythomania. Um, you know, don't be silly. Okay, we are all the way to Ramsey, uh, but before we go to him, let's take a break. <laughs> All right, welcome back. We're back from the break, and we're talking about Ramsey on this marathon episode in which I talk about the various stupid stuff that's being said on the internet, and I provide my own opinion. Again, as I said at the very beginning of this episode, diagnosing is a art form. It is not a science, as a lot of people would like it to be. It is highly in the eye of the beholder. It is, it is, you know, subject to uh, subjectivity and to opinion. And so I am providing mine. Uh, but as I also said at the beginning of this episode, there are things that the vast majority of clinicians would laugh at. And I'm trying to exhibit that laughing in this episode. <laughs> okay, Ramsey. A blog of thrones says antisocial personality disorder. And Thought Catalog says sexual sadism disorder. And I will say that these guys are getting it right. Uh, it appears that when someone is off the charts problematic, then the internet actually manages to get it right. Uh, I don't know why that is, but that seems to be the pattern. So a blog of thrones, uh, a blog of thrones, antisocial personality disorder, Thought Catalog, sexual sadism, sadism disorder. So yeah, in my opinion, Ramsey had sexual sadism disorder along with sadistic personality disorder, which isn't in the DSM, but sexual sadism disorder is. Since Ramsey demonstrated marked pleasure and complete lack of remorse from the suffering of others. He also suffered from antisocial personality disorder, which is in the DSM-5, or psychopathic personality disorder, which is not, uh, which are both related to sadism and sexual sadism. He's the most problematic character in the show, along with the mountain, in my opinion, since he clearly demonstrates tremendous pleasure in harming others in a variety of ways. And he engaged in frequent sadistic behavior, even though it w would harm him in the end. For example, 
He raped and killed many, many people, uh, many young women. And one time when he did this, it almost got him killed by Sir Roger Cassell. So he enjoyed raping and killing women, even when it didn't help him. You know, in contrast to Cersei's antisocial behavior, in which, at least from my memory, at least most of it, however, antisocial behavior was actually self, you know, preserving. That's the thing about these personality disorders. It's another sort of add to add to the nuance of personality disorders. A lot of times, the sort of behavior that people engage in as a as motivated by their personality disordered, you know, issues it actually is shooting themselves in the foot. People with borderline personality disorder frequently shoot themselves in the foot. Deep down, they are desperate, as most people are, but uh, borderline personality disorder people are even more desperate for a strong, secure attachment. But because they react so strongly to even the slightest hint of rejection, they end up pushing a lot of people away in this tragic recreation of their original rejection when they were children. And so... So Ramsey exhibits this in that he is, uh, you know, he's sadistic, he's antisocial, he's psychopathic, he has, you know, sexual sadism, which is just another way of saying you enjoy raping people. And his disorder gets in the way, almost gets him killed. Uh, So, you know, that's just one thing to think about. Okay, so conclusion about Ramsey, uh, he, uh, you know, was... He, he had a he had a difficult childhood I did a whole episode on on Ramsey so listen to that episode he has a fat Ramsey Bolton has a fascinating history fascinating childhood um, and uh, he had a lot of uh, biological you know Bruce Bolton was also uh, psychopathic and was also a sexual sadist he he would rape and kill people Bruce Bolton would when he was young uh, so uh, Ramsey may have gotten that a set of genes that sort of set up an epigenetic situation to create uh, that sort of personality. Plus he experienced, you know, a lot of difficulties as a child. So, uh, which is common for people with these kinds of disorders. So the conclusion is Ramsey has antisocial personality disorder and sexual sadism disorder in a big way. Uh, it's one of the more obvious cases in a game of Thrones or a song of ice of fire. All right. Robin Aaron, Lisa Aaron's uh, young boy, Robin Aaron, sweet Robin. A blog of thrones.com says Oedipus complex, Oedipus complex quote. When a child has too much affection towards the parent of the opposite sex and resentment, even jealousy toward the parent of the same one. All right. What do I have to say about it? Sure. Um, it's not an actual mental illness, Oedipus complex. It's not, uh, it's never been in the DSM. So, you know, it's one of those psychobabble terms that can mean a lot of different things. And a blog of Thrones is not using this term in a bad way. Actually, it's, it's, you know, it's a little close to the mark or I, I wouldn't be surprised that some, cl- some classic psychoanalysts wouldn't use this term to uh, explore Robin Aaron's personality. Um, so, you know, the idea is, is that because his mother is disturbed, he's, he, he becomes stuck in this early stage of development, this, this Oedipal development stage. And he is, he remains as an older boy, he remains very dependent on his mother as if he still was an infant. So uh, Oedipus complex, you could apply. So a blog of Thrones again, every once in a while, uh, or a broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs> anyway, Blog of Thrones got it right. Oedipus, I mean, not right, right, but uh, because a Blog of Thrones, if I remember right, is trying to present what they called, I think, medical conditions. And Oedipus complex is definitely not a medical condition. And it's actually also not a mental illness. Okay, Sansa. What do we ha- say about Sansa? Well, whatculture.com whatculture.com says no that she's sane Uh, a blog of thrones says masochism quote when a person obtains any sort of gain through tolerating mental or physical abuse from someone close to them i just want to read this again because this is one of the uh, this is this is so dumb uh but in in a different way that 
I won't laugh at it. I'm just going to, it makes me angry, actually. <laughs> so a blog of Thrones says, masochism. Sansa suffers from masochism because she's a person who gains, uh, who, who gets a gain, who gets something out of mental or physical abuse from someone close to them. Uh, it, I'm sure you understand how utterly stupid and offensive this is. Masochism, S- Sansa being raped by uh, Ramsey is, you know, she gets, she gets something out of this. What sort of effing gain did Sansa get from being repeatedly raped and abused by Ramsey? This is idiotic, offensive, victim blaming, uh, terrible, dumb. Uh, what? Masochistic? Sansa is masochistic. She gets, a, I mean, she's being abused. That's true. Uh, she's being traumatized. That's true. But she, she, you're, you're, you're going to claim that Sansa's getting something out of being, it sounds like a, sounds like a projection from whoever's writing this. Like, like you have some sick thing where you want Sansa to get a, get something out of, uh, there's, it's just gross. Let's move on. Well, no, let me conclude. Sansa, no, no mental illness. Don't be stupid. Okay. Sandor, the hound Clegane, Sandor Clegane, the hound. Again, I did a whole episode on him. Go listen to that if you want. A blog of Thrones says post-traumatic stress disorder. Psychology Today says post-traumatic stress disorder and alcohol use disorder. What do I say? Uh, yeah, they actually got this right. Blog of Thrones and Psychology Today actually got this right. Sandor clearly suffered from PTSD related to the ongoing extreme abuse he received from his older brother, Gregor Cogain. When he encountered the threat of fire. He consistently showed signs of PTSD, actual signs of PTSD. So that's, remember when I was talking about people talking about Aria has PTSD. If you, if you want, you know, now Sandor doesn't have a, he doesn't, we don't have a full assessment on Sandor, but the reaction that Sandor has when, when he, when he encounters fire, when, um, King's Landing is being attacked by Stannis and all those people. And there's, there's a, a, a burning fire or there's all the wildfire. Anyway, Sandor, even though he's a brave, courageous, fierce warrior, he freaked out and ran and not, and where did he run? He ran, he ran to Sansa. <laughs> he, he ran to Sansa and he said, Sansa, let's get out of here. And Sansa's like, no. And then he left. He just got out of town. I mean, that's how, that's how distressful that was for him. He was, he was, in, it was so distressful to him seeing all that fire that he just, he needed to escape, you know, it was like a claustrophobia feeling. So yeah, that, that, that's an example of physiological, likely physiological, but at least psychological distress as a result of the memory of the trauma being triggered. You know, his, his older brother, smashed his face into a burning fire, which resulted in massive disfiguring of his face. And so from that point forward, whenever he sees fire now, he, that, that deep trauma is triggered in him and he has a reaction. So, uh, so yeah, I, it, we don't have the full, all the, uh, criteria necessary endorsed for PTSD, but we have, I think enough to say, yeah, probably PTSD. Um, Sandor does not fit criteria for psychopathy or sadism since he demonstrated empathy and remorse, mainly for Sansa and Arya, and he didn't seem to harm others for pleasure. However, other clinicians could apply the label of antisocial personality disorder or psychopathy or sadism because he exhibited callousness and some pleasure upon harming others. But in my opinion, that attitude was likely part of his job, similar to someone in the military during wartime. And uh, also Sandor used alcohol to cope with stress, which would likely justify the label of alcohol use disorder, but we don't really know because we don't have all the data. So in conclusion, the hound suffers from likely PTSD showed, you know, definite signs of that. Uh, And one could make the argument of antisocial personality disorder and sadism. Um, not sexual sadism, but just general sadism. 
and uh, there's likely a case of alcohol use disorder. All right, moving on to Stannis Baratheon. A blog of thrones diagnoses him with stubbornness. Stubbornness is a mental illness. Uh, no, it's not. Sure, he's stubborn, but so is everyone else in this story. If anyone, if anyone in this story deserves to be stubborn, it's him. He was the rightful king since Robert died and Robert didn't have any legitimate heirs. So the crown was supposed to pass to him. And uh, if anyone was supposed to be, quote unquote, stubborn, it's him. Plus, he almost won. His stubbornness, you know, what you were labeling stubborn, was actually uh, instrumental in helping him almost win. If Winter had been a little slower or if he had managed to beat Ramsay, he might have kept marching south and gaining more power and, and you know, uh, everything might have worked out for him. So, uh, you know, one one person's stubborn is another person's determination. You know, um, and I was I was kind of pulling for Stannis until he killed his daughter, right? But uh, and of course, George Martin loves to make people suffer. So, of course, Stan, Stannis had to lose to Ramsay. All right, uh, let's move to Theon Greyjoy. Again, I did a full episode on Theon, so go check that out. What does MTV.com have to say about Theon Greyjoy? They say, quote unquote, complete break with reality, unquote. So that's their diagnosis. Again, a clinician was helping them write this. Complete break with reality. What in the world does that mean? Does that mean psychosis? Does that mean delusional? I don't know. Uh, it's not a diagnosis. It's not a complete break with reality is not in the DSM. So uh, that's, that's stupid. Plus, the basis of it is also dumb, which I'll get into in a second. A blog of thrones, uh, they diagnose with catalepsy, and it's even spelled wrong. Uh, presumably, since you own a website, you can Google things, and catalepsy is spelled with an S, not a C. But anyway, <laughs> catalepsy is what a blog of thrones has diagnosed him with, uh, which is not a mental disorder. Um, it's not a it's not a DSM disorder. It is muscular rigidity or a fixed posture. So it's it's like catatonic in a certain sense. It's it you're you can't move. You're stuck in a in a position. And what uh, Theon Greyjoy was 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 had rigid muscles and a fixed posture. Um, what are you even talking about? Psychology Today. Diagnosis Theon Greyjoy with Narcissistic Personality Disorder, Stockholm Syndrome, and Dissociative Disorder. Um, you could make a case for Narcissistic Personality Disorder given the way that he was acting when he was younger. Uh, I wouldn't say he meets the, meets the full criteria, but you know you could, you could make a case depending on your definition of that personality disorder. Stockholm Syndrome, absolutely. I'll get into more of that in a second. Dissociative Disorder, no. Uh, and I'll get into that. So Psychology Today got, I, I think, one and a half out of three. Uh, whatculture.com, they diagnose uh, Theon Greyjoy with psychotic break, which isn't a diagnosis. They, they diagnose Theon Greyjoy with dissociative identity disorder. They diagnose Theon Greyjoy with PTSD and Stockholm Syndrome. Okay, so let's get into this. Yes, he clearly suffered from a tremendous amount of physical and emotional trauma, but it's hard to tell if he meets criteria for PTSD. We don't see him getting triggered. We see him anxious. We see him scared, but that's not enough for us to apply the label of PTSD. Um, really, his, his syndrome is more akin to Stockholm Syndrome, you know, the, the experience of um, that abuse spouses will sometimes go through and that he became submissive to the abusive person to save his life. Again, uh, not in the DSM, uh, Stockholm syndrome. He also lost his identity as a result of the trauma, uh, not as a result of the, well, anyway, he, he lost his identity as a result of being tortured by Ramsey, which can happen when an abuser punishes identity congruent thoughts and behavior. So when it, whenever Theon said, you know, I'm Theon, uh, he would get punished. And when he said, I'm Reek, he was rewarded. Uh, this was exacerbated, I think, by the pressure Theon experienced from his father, sister, and other people, you know, other Ironborn to be ruthless and psychopathic 
which was counter to his sense of morality. So he, he had to do all these like atrocities, which were not really his thing. And this resulted in immense guilt and shame that contributed to him believing that he deserved to be punished by losing his identity. However, this was mainly what was presented to us in the TV show. In the books, it's less clear that he was remorseful. So, um, so again, getting in a narcissistic personality disorder, sure, um, traits maybe, but I wouldn't say the full-blown disorder. Again, if you have seen full-blown narcissistic personality disorder, you would definitely not think young Theon exhibited that, that presentation. Also, uh, Psychology Today said dissociative disorder and whatculture.com said dissociative identity disorder. And I just have to say that's like so dumb. Uh, clearly, you do not understand dissociative identity disorder. And um, uh, whatculture.com says psychotic break. Uh, MTV.com says complete break with reality. No, it, it's not psychotic. If someone abuses you to the point where you have to adopt a mindset that you that you are now reek and that you deserve to be punished and this is day in and day out if if you adopt that that's not dissociative identity disorder and again this is just another example of how the internet is stupid and frankly how some clinicians writing on the internet are stupid i mean you clearly just don't know what you're talking about dissociative identity disorder is it's a rare thing, but it happens. And, and when you are traumatized, usually as a young person, repeatedly, sort of like every day uh, for a number of years, you, your personality splits into these different identities that sometimes don't even know each other. So the fact that Theon basically just probably made a calculation as mine and said, look, I got to become reek because that's the only way I'm going to avoid getting tortured. So become reek, act like reek, even think like reek, and that will save my life. And it did. And then when the time came that he could become Theon, he went back to, he went back to thinking he was Theon, but he was probably always Theon. He just was internally sort of adopting a character to survive. And that's not dissociative identity disorder. Don't be dumb. And uh, catal catalepsy, uh, I don't even know where that comes from. I don't know how a blog of thrones even got there. Uh, is there something in the TV show or the books in which he becomes rigid in terms of his muscles? If so, uh, then maybe, I guess. So I would say, uh, you know, if you want to be narcissistic, if you want to apply the narcissistic label, then sure, traits of narcissistic personality disorder, but definitely not the full-blown disorder. Definite Stockholm Syndrome, not a DSM diagnosis, but, you know, a human phenomena. And maybe PTSD, but definitely more assessment would be needed. It's, it's hard to say. All right. We have two more people. Oh, my God. We have Tyrion and we have Tywin Lannister. Let's talk about Tyrion first. Whatculture.com calls him alcoholic. MTV.com calls him alcoholic narcissist. That's, that's the diagnosis, alcoholic narcissist. A blog of thrones.com says Napoleon slash small man syndrome, Napoleon syndrome slash small man syndrome, uh, which I will quote a known term to describe the inferiority complex that short men tend to possess. This causes them to overcompensate by putting more effort than men of regular height would uh, end quote. What in the world are you talking about, Blog of Thrones? That is the dumbest thing. Napol it's not a known, ter known term to who? Uh, the internet? Napoleon sy syndrome? Small man syndrome? Uh, this is one of those, you know, offensive stereotypes. You're, you're short, you're little, and th that automatically makes you have this Napoleon syndrome. <laughs> um, plus, you know, Tyrion's a legit dude. Like he has legit um, powers, you know, he's smart and he's diplomatic and he cares about people. And, uh, you know, he's trying to be bigger than, I don't know. I don't even know what you're saying. Napoleon complex like this is dumb. Uh, Thoughtcatalog.com, alcoholism. And again, since this site provides treatment plans, 90 days of alcohol rehab, 90 days of alcohol rehab. 
All right. What do I think? Well, as with Cersei, it's hard to tell what his drinking is really like in real life. You know, yeah, he drinks a lot just like Cersei, but more assessment would be needed to see if he fit criteria. I mean, let's look at the actual criteria for alcohol use disorder. So, um, there are different degrees. So, uh, if it, so you can, but you need at least two of the following taken in larger amounts than intended. Has, has, has Tyrion ever taken larger amounts of wine than intended? You know, I don't know if we know that. I don't know if you know the answer to that. Persistent desire to use or unsuccessful efforts to cut back. So has he ever tried to cut back and failed at cutting back? Eh, hard to say, but you know, possible. Lots of time spent getting alcohol, using it and being hung over. Again, unknown. A lot of craving, uh, probably. Uh, there were times when he, uh, in at least the TV show that I remember that he was like, where's the wine? <laughs> I need the wine. Um, interference with work and with home life. Uh, hard to say. You, he uses in the face of consequences. That's unknown to me. Gives up on activities in order to use alcohol. That's unknown. Does he use when it's dangerous to do so? Mm, hard to say. Does he use even when he knows that it's harming him? Uh, maybe. He seems to know that wine isn't the best thing and he uses it anyway. Does he have tolerance? You know, does he need more to get drunk? I would say probably. Does he experience withdrawal symptoms when he doesn't, you know, get alcohol? Yeah, I think they exhibited that, at least in the TV show. So he seems to qualify for a few of these. Now, I would not... So uh, the the DSM-5, the new DSM-5, uh, the criteria for substance disorders, they have a very low threshold. So in order to qualify for the mild version of alcohol use disorder, you only need two of these criteria to be met. Moderate is four to five and six plus is severe. So again, I just, I just want to say this to you out there. Uh, if, you, if you drink alcohol and you, and, and you qualify for two of these 11 criteria, then you have a mental illness. So again, I just want to, which, which I don't agree with, by the way, I think DSM-5 set the criteria way too fucking low. But anyway, so out of the 11 criteria, if you say yes, or even, you know, kind of, and maybe to these, then you have to admit to yourself that according to DSM-5, you have, you have alcohol use disorder. Uh, one, do you take in larger amounts than intended? You know, do you ever say, ah, tonight I'll have two drinks and you, instead you take three? Has that happened to you? Number two, persistent desire to use or unsuccessful efforts to cut back. Have you ever tried to cut back? Like, oh, okay, I'm not going to drink as much for the next, you know, few months. And then you, you don't succeed at that goal. Has that ever happened to you? Number three, lots of time spent getting alcohol, lots of time spent using it, and lots, lots of time being spent hungover. So it's sort of a higher threshold uh, thing. So, you know, uh, number four, craving. Have you ever craved alcohol? Like, boy, I need a drink. Or, you know, you're just like, oh, man, I can't wait to go out with my friends and have a drink. Or, you know, I need a beer. You know, has that ever happened to you? Uh, number five, interference with work and home. Has your drinking ever made it uh, difficult to be in your relationship or difficult to work or difficult for your, um, you know, home life? Number six, have you ever used in the face of consequences? Drinking more than one or two drinks, most of us understand that's not good for our health, right? So have you ever done that? Number seven, give up on activities to use. So this is sort of a higher level threat, uh, criteria, criterion too. You know, have you ever, for instance, not gone to a birthday party because you wanted to stay home and drink or something? Uh, number eight, do you ever drink alcohol when it's dangerous to do so? Uh, like, have you ever driven drunk or, or drank when you knew you had to drive home? Has that ever happened to you? Number nine, do you ever drink alcohol when you know it's harming you? So it's similar to the one I was saying before. Number 10, do you have a tolerance? And do, you, do you need to drink more now than you used to um, to, to feel a buzz? You know, 
Number 11, have you ever experienced withdrawal symptoms, which is basically a hangover? Um, so if you have said, so I don't know how, if you counted how many said yes, but if you said yes two or three times, then you have mild alcohol use disorder. If you said yes four to five, then you have moderate. And you see, if you said yes to six plus, you have severe alcohol use disorder. Uh, so the threshold is, you know, anyway, it's hard to know if Tyrion had it, but he probably did. So we could probably apply either a mild or moderate alcohol use disorder to Tyrion, but, uh, he doesn't suffer from a narcissistic personality disorder or Napoleon small man syndrome. Uh, you know, a, as with Cersei and as with Jamie and as with, you know, a lot of these people, they are they are legitimately important people. And Tyrion Lannister, thinking that he is smart, thinking that he's important, it's true. He is important and he is smart. And so uh, I wouldn't say he has a narcissistic personality disorder. Again, uh, don't be dumb. Okay, Tywin Lannister. Tywin Lannister. A blog of thrones says megalomania. Megalomania. Because, quote, ruthless, amoral, high ambitious, ruthless, amoral, highly ambitious, but with a thirst and lust for power, unquote. Uh, what do I have to say about that? Megalomania is not a diagnosis, and uh, it's really true for many of the people in Game of Thrones that they're ruthless and ambitious and they lust for power. I mean, so. Uh, why would you apply that? Tywin isn't acting really any different than anyone else would in his position. It's, it's, it's everyone has their job. You know, it, what that, this is all based on medieval Europe, right? And for those houses, when you are in charge of a major house, it's your job to sustain the house. And if that means being ruthless, then that's what it means. And if you aren't ruthless, then someone else is going to take you over. With Tywin, you know, specifically, just, you know, his story, when he was a kid, his his dad, so, you know, this is Tyrion's grandfather. So Tywin, when Tywin was a kid, and, and his father almost lost their seat to, of power because Tywin's father was weak and not ruthless. And a bunch of other houses, minor houses, rose up against uh, Tywin's father and almost uh, eliminated Tywin and his family from power, even from their lives. And Tywin, as a young person, actually stepped in and took over and uh, fought back these smaller houses and sustained House Lannister. So if Tywin had not been ruthless as a young person, House Lannister wouldn't exist anymore. That's what the world that they live in. <laughs> the reason why Tywin is ruthless is because he has to be ruthless because the society made him into a ruthless person. So to call him a megalomaniac, megalomani like there's something wrong with him, just completely misunderstands the context. It's similar to when people will label an inner city kid who his only means of, of making a living and paying for food for his family is to sell cocaine on the corner and sell, you know, uh, meth on the corner. Well, he's breaking the law. And, you know, maybe that involves being violent with rival drug people or something. Well, he has antisocial personality disorder. You know, he's, he's breaking the law. He doesn't have a regard for, you know, other people's lives. Uh, what's wrong with this kid? You know, he has, he has a mental illness. But if you understand the context that this person lives in, then you understand, oh, it's his environment. That's, that's, he, this is his life. He, for whatever reason, feels as though, and, and may be true, that this is his way to survive. And if he doesn't become ruthless and if he doesn't sell drugs and if he doesn't b break the law, then him and his family will not survive in this environment. And so it's, it's not a mental illness to survive is the point. And, and Tywin Lannister is one of those people and he does not qualify for a diagnosis. So I would say Tywin does not qualify for any DSM diagnosis. So, wow. How long, did, how long was that? Was that three hours? My God. Uh, let me know what you think. And I'll probably talk more in depth about other people. People want me to talk about Jorah. People want me to talk about Tyrion. Uh, and and I, it's fun. So I probably will. 
but anyway, let me know what you think about all this stuff. And again, if you haven't already, please become a patron of the podcast by going to patreon.com. When you become a patron, you get access to all these really super interesting deep dives that we've done over the years. So uh, please, 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 if you can, if you haven't already, become a patron. If you're already a patron and you up, up, and you up your situation to $20, then you will get a mug. I'm about to send out a bunch of mugs in a couple of days uh, to some people who are in this category. Uh, I have to say this mug is awesome. I use it every day. Uh, not narcissistically, not only because of narcissism, because my face is on it, but also because the cup is the perfect coffee cup, the perfect handle, the perfect size. The, it's kind of thinner and taller, but not too thin and too tall, if that makes any sense. Also, if you can, uh, tell, a, tell a friend or a colleague about the podcast. I think a lot of people hear about us through word of mouth. So, if you're in a graduate training program, you know, tell, tell others around you. Um, that's, you know, spread the word. That's cool if you can do that. Also, if you can rate us on iTunes, that'd be cool. Uh, and let me know uh, if you rate us on iTunes and I'll send you some swag. Also, join the Facebook fan group, Face, Psychology in Seattle Facebook, or Psychology in Seattle fan group, I think it's called. And it uh, has a lively group of individuals there. Also, you can... Join our Instagram, of which I post a picture about once every two months. <laughs> uh, so there's that. Uh, also, you can like the regular Psychology in Seattle page on Facebook, in which I post tougher bluffs every Tuesday. Yeah, out there, people. I know that there are people that probably don't know about this, um, but the, every Tuesday morning, I post a tougher bluff on the Facebook page, not the Facebook fan page, but the regular Facebook page. And um, it, it's always a lively participation situation. And people in my family, including my parents, often participate. <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, uh, that is that for that episode. Thanks for sticking with it. And please take care of yourself and take care of others because we all deserve it. 